You're listening to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. This makes my nipples hard. I was so happy when my grandma would listen to November Rain by Guns N' Roses. I'm like, at least it's kind of in the genre and it made me feel connected to her. So she accepted it as something that was okay to listen to. All right. All right. I'm going to try again. We're good. Now, this one has a piano in it. That's why I like it. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So pretty. It's a real instrument. Wait, can you do it? Can you do it in a gangster rap voice? We did recently start a show with trying to do an eighties rap. A boo, we a did. Ch- a boo, you know, like one of that just really <laughs> <laughs> It's there. It's not good, but that's the point. No, it's, no, it's not people good. don't listen to this show for good or accurate. They listen to this show, don't they? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Actually, Paul, that sounded more like a like a Canadian uh, a gangster rap. A boo. Ch- a boo. <laughs> 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 Drinking that maple syrup, yo. <laughs> Sorry, shutting up. This episode is just going to be us starting the show, I think. <laughs> over and over and over. Hi there, welcome to the show. In today's episode, we are thrilled to have a talented, whether they like me to say it or not, duo from Air 47, a band that creates original compositions infused with a deep, deep love for DOS games and just the right touch of metal. This band is led by both John Paul Sapsford and he is a professional music teacher and an audio engineer and Trolls Plymart, or as many of us know him and can pronounce a little bit more easily as the Space Quest historian. And they currently have a Kickstarter going that we are going to learn a whole bunch about during this episode and probably something to do with something, something Space Quest. So, hey guys, how's it going? How do you not breathe? Hey. <laughs> that, that was pretty good. Thank, uh, congrats. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Doing well. First try. <laughs> First try. That's right. There were no other takes. That was amazing, guys. Out of the park. <laughs> Nothing but net. Swoosh. Well, um, I can't help but feel like this intro is really interrupting our conversation. <laughs> yeah, we can just get back to that now, please. That was <laughs> goodness. Yeah. Uh, cheers. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, we formed a band called Era 47 because we were making music together already, and uh, it occurred to me that John Paul wasn't getting the recognition that he very much deserves for making my ugly shit sound decent. So uh, we decided to put a band together. At least that's my head canon. I don't know what JPS is. That, that, that's about it. You know, we were, we were just doing a bunch of music together and you kind of said, hey, let's do this as an actual band, you know, and mm-hmm. have like a name and everything like that. And- Tell me a little bit about how you chose your name. What is Air 47 and why does it make a good name for you guys? Oh, I want to take this one. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, of course, of course. Because <laughs> I think, uh, again, this is this is my, uh, I, I have this internal struggle where I want to decide everything, but I kind of want to give the impression that it's a democracy. So, you know, <laughs> I, um, we, we, we did a couple of records under a moniker called One Kid from Andromeda. Uh, that would be our Duke Nukem record and our Gabriel Knight record. Uh, so, and I figured that's a terrible name for a band when there's two people in it. Uh, so I, <laughs> I threw out a couple of ideas for names, but I really, really wanted to call it Era 47. So I kept mm. harping on that, like <laughs> subconsciously steering him towards it. And the, <laughs> the reason why I really wanted to call it Era 47 is because one, I, it had to sound industrially. It had to sound mm-hmm. like it was a 90s industrial band, like, uh, you know, your front 242s, your frontline assemblies, your, you know, skinny puppies, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It had to sound like it was 90s and, and raw and, you know, edgy and anything with a number in it and the word error sounds pretty cool. Um, and the reason why Error 47, why it's a 47 is because, well, obviously it's a Space Quest reference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, apparently it's also a Quest for Glory 4 reference, but I, I was unaware yeah. of that at the time. Um, but in Space and Quest And one that 6, plagued me for years. Ugh, anyways, oh. go on. <laughs> Oh, and in Space Quest 6, it crops up once, but it is infamous. If you play Space Quest 6 on a computer that's just slightly too fast, you get all the way to the end of the Polysorbate 60 sequence, you get back on the deep ship, you're supposed to run this little cartridge through a scanner in the compost, and if your computer's too fast, it inexplicably bombs you back to DOS. No warning, nothing, just bombs you back to DOS with the most unhelpful mm-hmm. error message ever. Error 47, mm-hmm. not an object, which we oh, should yes. have called our first album now that I think about it, not an object. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so that's um that's where it comes from space quest 6 the era 47 
That's perfect. Yeah, in, in Quest for Glory 4, it's when you're going down the, for me, it would hit when I was going down the slide at the goo, and then you, you're at the top. And apparently, I could have just turned the speed slider down, which I didn't realize at the time, and it might have let me bypass it. But I didn't, I didn't know, and I didn't have the internet or patches. So I'm just like, well, there goes my favorite game in the series. I know it's going to be. And it turns out it was one of my, one of my favorite games in the series. Mm -hmm. No, in, in Space Quest 6, it is an absolute death sentence. If you're playing this on an, mm -hmm. like an old DOS machine and yep. it was it was too fast, there was no way around it. The speed slider would yep. do absolutely squat. It would just bomb you to dust. And even if you somehow managed to like download a save game from somewhere and get past that bit, uh, the game would still fuck around with you uh, oh, later. There's no. a bit right at the end where you have to uh, climb down uh, to the, you know, the <laughs> for those of you who haven't played Space Quest 6, this is going to sound horrible, but uh, anyway, you're microscopic and inside a woman's body and she has a tapeworm <laughs> and you're supposed to <laughs> climb down this ledge to, and, and the screen is supposed to scroll down slowly to reveal this tapeworm inside her bowel. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you're on a fast computer, the screen just keeps scrolling, goes right past the tapeworm into a black no. nothingness void and you can't Which is move and you can't do just anything. like in real life yeah wow like just, life. i can't stop laughing at how just normal and accepted that would have been if you didn't say something <laughs> well if you haven't played it this might sound insane oh my god yeah. well let me ask you real quick uh being being the you know literally the historian on this the the i was always fascinated with space quest 6 having that patch disc that came out just because it was like this weird like a, a cd rom only game that you could also have a floppy for so it was like one of my <laughs> one of my white whales was finding that damn floppy just because it was a floppy disk that said Space Quest Six on it, and it was a patch. And I'm just wondering, did that, is that what that fixed? Uh, no, I don't think it fixed anything. Uh, <laughs> not, 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 I think I think what the uh, patch. I'm, I'm actually I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I think the patch just fixed uh, some like driver errors. Uh, Space Quest Six had a yes. Uh, Space Quest Six had some problems with because uh, they tried to play multiple. Uh, 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 multiple digital samples at once in a few places, mm -hmm. and I don't know if, you, if I don't know if you ever noticed, but uh, uh, Sierra games in particular, whenever they try to play more than one digital sample, Gabriel Knight, the Sins of the Fathers, really does this a lot. Like when you're in the uh, in any you know, like a voodoo ritual, for instance, when they have this background chatter of the voodoo ritual attendees, and then you know they're supposed to play like narration on top of that, everything just gets delayed for several mm -hmm. seconds. Like there, uh, SCI is just not capable of playing more than one digital sample at a time and space quest 6 would just regularly crash whenever it tried to do that so i think that's what the uh, floppy disk tried to, i'm not I, I i actually don't know i don't have that floppy disk i'm gonna take your wild stab out of this fact <laughs> go to spacequest.net which is co-owned by myself and mr brandon bloom we bought it off the original creator uh it should tell you what it actually does <laughs> okay it's still full of all the original information that the original creator friends uh, compiled. Oh, okay. I, for some reason, I thought it was Jess that was the, the original. Where, where did Jess come from? Oh, see, it was no, the broom no, closet. Yeah, <laughs> that was the broom closet. The two rivals at the time of the uh, Space Quest fandom heyday, we had the uh, virtual broom closet and we had spacequest.net. Uh, the broom closet was like the OG, and then spacequest.net was the young whippersnapper who came in and you know <laughs> tried to tried to ruffle some feathers and we had like two message boards that eventually ended up like competing with each other. Awesome. Um, no, nah, it, it kind of, it turned a little messy oh. uh, to be honest, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but hey, uh, it was, uh, we, we, because space quest seven got canceled. So we ran out of things to talk about and eventually we just turned on each other. It was, it was a Aww. bit messy, but we got back together when space venture got, was announced That sort of, you know, mended a lot of bridges. And in fact, Excuse me. Um, in fact, uh, the virtual broom closet and spacequest.net merged to form a singular message board. I mean, all the message boards have been shut down for wow. years and years at that point, but they sort of merged and became the official uh, space venture message board for a little while. What a, what uh, a character arc, you know? It's like a real hero's right. journey. <laughs> I mean, space venture brought tons of people together. It was it was glorious for the first two or three years. I think. John, I need to ask you, how did you get into adventure games? So. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my dad's worked for a bunch of technology companies and computer companies here in Chicago, and one of them did some outsource work for Sierra or something like that. No one remembers. My, my father, sadly, even passed away for about a decade now. Um, but it boiled down to him getting sent all of the Sierra games. Whoa. So I just grew up playing these games that were being sent to him, and you know, Space Quest was always the best of course so of course. that's what kind of, you know <laughs> you're in i was company. on twitter one time and i started following um 
that's nostalgic. I don't even know how I found him, but I did. I was, you know, watching the old DOS games, and then he was retweeting or doing some podcast or something with trolls. So I just started following trolls and just got in touch with him a few months later. And you're leaving out the interesting bit. (laughs) (laughs) I always love that bit, though. You tell it better than I do. Really? Okay, because I was kind of because the last podcast we did, I told the story, so I was kind of looking forward to hearing you tell your side of oh, the story. But uh, yeah, so um, you know, I've been listening to some of the pie. I think it was it was the backseat uh, the designers podcast, mm-hmm. and you, you had it mentioned about like you know what this guy probably wants to do, um, probably wants to do his own games. He just talks like he does, did at that point. So I decided, because I've been trying to get into doing more scoring work and things like that and getting out of the rock world. Um, so I just dropped them an email and said, hey, if you're ever looking for help, I'm a musician, I'm in Chicago, blah, 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 blah. You know, let me know. I'd be happy to help out with anything. You know, just trying to get into this, this world a little bit. Mm-hmm. He sent me a, you know, he says it was kind of blow off. I thought it was perfectly nice. Just that, no, nope, no, nope, I'm not, you know, I don't do video games, but thanks, you know. Mm-hmm. And then a few months later, he was doing a game jam game and mm-hmm. with uh, Amber Lee. And he sent me an email and said, hey, is that offer still stand? I need someone to do music for this game. And we did uh, ramp it up. And we've been working together pretty solidly ever since. And that was, what, 2017, I want to say? Yeah, mm-hmm. sounds about right. I mean, the, uh, yeah. the story is, is, is caked in way too much niceness that's not how i remember it. <laughs> but yeah that is that is a nicer way of, of putting it if my recollection is um the director's cut <laughs> <laughs> my recollection is that i i had done a, a an adventure game jam game and john paul emailed me and said hey i'm 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 also you know a musician and if you ever need any help i'm i'm i'd be happy to i don't want any money for it i just want to jam with some fine folks and i totally blew him off I was like, no, I do my own shit. <laughs> I don't follow any <laughs> rules but my own. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, and then I had to come crawling back to him because we were doing Ramp It Up and I, I was going to do the music for that myself, but we were seriously stressed for time. So I did email him on my hands and knees saying, yeah, um, if that offer still stands, I'd love to take you up on it. And he delivered some absolutely wonderful music for that game. Um, much better than anything I would have done anyway. So yeah, that's my side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they both work together. The truth's somewhere in the middle. So we're somewhere in the exactly. Middle. <laughs> it's been quite a long time at this point. My memory's terrible. So no, it's uh, and and I have a penchant for self-deprecation, but that is how I remember it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of epic creations that started. Like t- as much as the in, the uh, adventure game scene quieted down from like 2000 to 2010, 2015, and in 2015 with the Facebook groups and the Sierra groups and stuff. I I mean, because I missed out on the message boards and all all that side of things. To me, that was the resurgence and all these people started connecting back up. And hey, I used to work for this company. Company and I'm really interested in it. And that, that's when the magic started coming back for me. And I started realizing that my whole childhood was coming back to haunt me in a good way. Mm. Um, did any of you kind of notice the same? Like, when did you notice things coming back into style? Like, if adventure games are kind of going to be cool again. Uh, for me, it was right around that same time. I started mm-hmm. seeing some of, you know, uh, Dave Gilbert's games, the Wacky Eye Games ones. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of, you know, uh, um, and what it was for me, actually, as I was sitting here thinking about it, it was, what was that service? Was it, um, uh, um, it was, the, it was oh. an online service before Steam. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh. Itch? And no, Game Jolt? Just, no, it wasn't Game Jolt. It was, it was a, it was an app and it was, you could play all these games for like $10 a month. It was the first service like that. And it was oh, all cool. digital. Games mm-hmm. And they had tons and tons of adventure games, all the Space Quests, uh, the Sam and Max games like that. And that really and they were some of the highest rated games on the whole service. And they had, you know, triple A games and stuff, too. So mm-hmm. that was when it started to catch my interest again. That sounds like GameSpy. I don't know. Might be. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have been GameSpy. I can't remember. It's been so long now. That 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 you know that passed me by entirely because that was a North American thing, and mm-hmm. uh, ah. they didn't didn't quite have that over here. Uh, <laughs> I'm in Denmark, by the way. If anyone uh, didn't know that, mm-hmm. as end of the world, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> 
So your timelines for things might have been a little bit different or was it about the same? I mean, you never really left. I think with you, Trolls, you didn't ever leave the community oh, once there was a community to be a part of on and off. Oh, I, you've always I, been there longer I than any of us. back on it. No, no, no. I, no, I skipped down. I turned my back on it. Um, I, uh, I was really, when I was 15 years old, I got on the internet for the first time in the local library uh, in, in mm -hmm. the Danish town that I grew up in. And the first thing I searched for was Space Quest and up comes Roger Wilco's Virtual Broom Closet by Jess. And I mm -hmm. sent him an email, uh, which I then went back a week later to check uh, at the local <laughs> library still. We didn't have internet back home. So, um, and, and we got to chatting and we started swapping floppy disks in snail mail. So I started like contributing stuff to his site by sending him actual five and a quarter. No, not uh, three and a half quarter three inch. And half. Mm -hmm. Three and a half inch. Good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, three and a half inch floppy disks in snail mail, and and that and then you know we finally got internet at home, and he he started up a message board, and that's how I kind of got into that whole online fandom thing crowd. And then, like I mentioned earlier, uh, when Space Quest Six uh, came out in 1995, we mm -hmm. I mean. It's, uh, the, the Space Quest fandom was already like really all encompassing. There were tons. I think at, at that point there were more Space Quest fan sites online than there were like Quake fan sites or Doom fan sites. It was like massive. And then everyone was looking forward to Space Quest 7 and it got cancelled. And like I said, people started getting a little antsy and a little, okay, so what's left to talk about really? And mm -hmm. the whole thing just kind of went to a head and I got a bit like, oh, well, well, to hell with it then. And so I sort of turned my back on everything, decided to go to university and get a job like a normal person. Um, yeah, I know, boo. And then, <laughs> for some reason, I can't really remember, I think uh, I just, uh, like, on a whim, after, uh, like, around 2004 or five or ish I just decided to boot up Space Quest 1 again and just play through it on an afternoon just for shits and giggles, just to see if I still had it. And it was fun. And <laughs> then I... Uh, started like playing games just sort of in my spare time, my off time. Uh, you know, when, when my wife went to sleep, I'd stay up for a couple of hours uh, and play games on, you know, the little laptop we had hooked up to the TV in our little one room apartment um, with the sound off and all that. <laughs> um, and it was fun. And at, at one point, I played a game called Gone Home that you might have heard about, um, which mm -hmm. is one of the most powerful and wonderful stories uh, in, in an interactive modern game that I've ever uh, seen. Uh, I literally <laughs> I literally could not masturbate for three days because I was so blown away by right. it. Um, <laughs> that resonates with me. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I get um, that. Um, but but so so, uh, so I went online to look for uh, people who had uh, played this game because I wanted to know all the ins and outs and secrets and stuff. It's kind of a weak spot of mine. I have to once I get into something, I really have to know everything about it. Right. Um, and I stumbled upon a let's player uh, called Jack Septiguy, who was not the titan that he is today. He had uh, he had quite a lot of followers, but uh, but not anything as astronomical as he is today. Uh, but he played Gone Home. And he was doing this Let's Play, and I was like, okay, I have never seen a Let's Play before. That actually looks kind of fun. I wonder if I can do that. And so I just started, you know, looked into how, how does he actually do that with a little camera in the top left corner and the, you know, game screen and all that stuff. How does he do that? And I just sat down and started, like, playing games in my bedroom uh, on a shitty little laptop with no lights and my microphone sort of perched in a, in a garbage bin next to me <laughs> with a pillow to prop it up. And it was really professional stuff. And, you know, that's when I started YouTubing, just with the shits and giggles of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's how I sort of came back to it, quote unquote. And then I learned that around 2005, uh, 2006 is when Wadge and I uh, decided to bring back adventure games in style and, and you know, mm -hmm. prove that you could actually sell them for money and have a successful career doing it. Uh, and, you know, digital storefronts were invented, which means you can now circumvent publishers. You didn't have to buy shelf space at the local Costco or whatever the fuck. Uh, so that was mm -hmm. a whole revolution of itself i had no idea i just wanted to play the games that i grew up playing again now that i actually had spare time to do it and so yeah i don't keep up with the times so i just <laughs> roll with whatever none of us do we're all listening to vinyls and playing big box games so you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, checks out my google search from this morning was what font did they use in vhs's <laughs> <laughs> i really i want that for my game somewhere i don't know where we'll we'll, we'll find oh. space for it later Dude, that was a, we had a whole 
like search party out for uh, when we did the King's Chill vinyls because I wanted the label on the actual vinyls to re- to look like those seventies vinyls that all for some reason had the same font on them. Right, they right. Totally uh, you, yeah, you, you can you can, and it turns out the font is named Universe. Uh, huh? Without the e at the end, uh, but but there was like a whole search party on my Discord, like going around, like what is that font? We had okay. like uh, we took photos of our dad's record collections and shit, and I'm like what what's this font? And we actually found it, and that's why the King's Chill record labels look like like they do. Uh, yeah, this you know it's a, it's a good collective of of nerds going on where it's like I love a good font hunt. You know that takes me back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm on the hunt for a font I found on a gravestone right now. I just call it classic grave digger. So. Yeah. Okay. That Discord is a magical place. There is right? no topic you can ask a question about where you won't get a good answer, you know? And so technical <laughs> and so off the wall, or even just like, what should I have for breakfast today? It doesn't matter. It's just a great place. Yeah. I have no idea how that happened. Again, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the whole thing of just surrounding myself with people who can sort of soak up or, or deflect my dumb and actually turn it into a great place to be. That's how yeah. that's how the Discord sort of evolved around me. I love the Discord because because it's like nobody lets anything go there. Like they will get to the bottom of it. And sometimes I'll just retroactively read, you know, especially when you were doing a lot of like the discovering bugs and um, mm-hmm. doing that kind of video series on on debugging and f- digging through SCI Companion and stuff. Just retroactively reading you guys like sending the hounds out basically with like you know the sniff of something oh, was, was so much fun. Was- that was so much. Uh, oh, some of those, some of those people who, uh, uh, you know, like cracked the code and went spelunking in the in the code and all that. I mean, I, I took all the credit for it because I put the video together, but it was really their, uh, you know, their work that I was just piping out into uh, uh, onto YouTube. So yeah, you're absolutely right. The nerds in, in Nerd Central on the Discord are magical people, and they're fucking sadists as well. Right. That whole trip <laughs> they have going with turning old uh, uh, device drivers uh, on their heads, like the, the whole pain train thing was uh, getting yeah. like old CGA drivers running on old, old DOS games. Like uh, Pickle Dog, one of the moderators, actually wrote a CGA driver for Doom. Wow. That, uh, for like proper vanilla DOS Doom. You can play that in <laughs> four-color so CGA. It's oh, so it's so good. Warm to my heart. That pain train stuff is beautiful. Oh, boy. You're, that is, this is good shit here. Uh, sorry, d- d- derailing as I always do. Again, brain on autopilot. No, there is no rail. It's that's not no. you. We just we never laid yeah. a track out. We're just we're just out not here in the desert having a good time. Cool. <laughs> it feels like the desert. God damn, it's warm in here. <laughs> so what do you what are you guys roles together as far as Era Forty Seven? Because I am curious, like, you know. What, yeah, what what makes you guys a team? In other words, like, does one of you do one thing, or is it like a collaboration, or? JPS, you have to take this one. I've been running my mouth for the last 20 minutes. Yeah. So we, we both do our, our own things on it. So as far as the, the full instruments, I, I play all the guitar and Trolls does all of the, the drum work. But what, what happens is Trolls will, will do most of the hard work and he'll take, you know, the midis and, you know, translate them into something workable and he orchestrates them you know, which is selecting the different instruments and stuff like that to be used. And he arranges them and does all the nitty gritty work there. Then he'll send off those individual tracks to me and I will mix them, edit them, uh, master them and and throw the guitar on there and stuff like that. And yeah, together it's, 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 it's what trolls was talking about. You know, you always need to surround yourself with people that are good at what you're bad at. And Mm -hmm. We, we complement each other really well in that. And that was kind of Ken Williams' whole idea for Sierra, right? Yeah, Honestly. yeah, exactly. My, my old singers say it all the time, you know, because he's a guitarist as well. Um, but he's a, you know, he goes, I got you in the band because you are you can do all the lead stuff and everything. And I got, you know, our drummer is really good at this and that. And it's just that, that, that way you complement each other rather than step on toes. Right. Yeah. And you just... That's like- John Paul, you handled the loofs, I would imagine, for trolls <laughs> when it came down to that. <laughs> they handled the what? Sorry, I got my thing down. All the all the loofs, you know, all the all the complicated. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, I do, and I've got to tone it down some because I don't want it skipping on uh, on the vinyl. I have to, it's always the most terrifying thing because you know if I'm doing it for a video game soundtrack or just something to put on YouTube, I can listen on my speakers here. I can go to my car and listen to it. 
you can't do that test with vinyl. You just have to wait the six months until oh. they send trolls the the uh, test pressings and then cross your fingers that it didn't yes. screw everything up. Oh, wow, wow, that stressed me out just listening to that, right? Cause, and and you really, really relatable with the car thing because I always use my car to, to for the – at least, at least those final mixes. You're making sure the bass is nice and warm and surrounding. And I, I don't know what I would do without that. Oh yeah, and, and it's and it's it, you know that's that's a, a tip. I'm going to be the old guy here for any of you young kids out there. Always have some reference monitors where you know what things sound like on. You know, you go to your car, you know what music sounds like in your car. Music of the mm-hmm. same genre that you're, you know, ideally mixing and producing there. That way, you can tell if it sounds messed up. Right. That is that is brilliant advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mine is not the car. My car sounds terrible. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's, there's an uh, auxiliary, auxiliary aux, that's a hard word to say, auxiliary, fuck it, AUX lead um, <laughs> coming out of my car. But for some reason, like there's a, there's a, uh, some soldering in there that's not, or some isolation or something that in there that's not working. So whenever you plug anything into it, it goes, <laughs> and it, oh, it, even if you turn it, down and, and oh it's terrible and if you and if you just turn the volume up on the on the source like on on your phone that you just plugged in then it, it, it you know the signal is way too loud and it starts distorting and you get these awful clipping sounds my car is not where i do my <laughs> in fact <laughs> for error 47 and for most of the stuff that we've done uh most of the stuff i have sent jps and this is why it's so good to have an actual professional in the band um most of the stuff I do, I do, I, I, I do with the greatest sin of all. I mix on my headphones. You're not supposed to do that. That's bad. That's bad. Very, very bad. Get yourself good speakers. Never mix on the headphones because headphones uh, are not. You, you can't trust headphones. But I do, uh, and I, I can comfortably do that now because mm-hmm. I will just. I, at this point, I've stopped bothering to even level shit out. Probably, I just sent. To, I mean, if you if you look at my project files, they're clipping, they're they're awful, they're messy, and I just send the stems to JPS, and he'll make sense of it. Um, oh, which is that's what we need for our podcast. They're ch- <laughs> some we, <laughs> so we sense start sending, Yeah, exactly. We send it to you too, JPS. Is that the, you can just make it all make sense? Change the words too, as you need to. I mean, if we say something wrong, <laughs> that's a great. I actually though. probably I like still. That. I. I, I I do some side work here just for like local podcast people and stuff. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it got to the point where it's just, I was, you know, if if I was getting it from the same people again, I would listen, I wouldn't listen to the whole thing. I would just check a few spots and okay, this preset still works, you know? Right. (laughs) Uh, Let's, let's real quick. So the musician nerd, I mean, just wants to do like a kind of like a gear uh, gear check with you guys. Like I was telling Anna before the show that, that John, I looked up uh, you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, so, well, first I wanted to see the face, right? Like, who am I talking to kind of thing, as I always do. But I was like, I wanted to see the guitar you played. Because I, just, you know, as, as somebody else, a fellow musician for, for long before game stuff, really, professionally anyway, um, I, I learned that you can tell a lot about people from the guitars they play and, and, and stuff like that. So I'm just kind of curious to, like, check in and do do kind of a, I don't know, a gear check. Like, uh, I'll start with you, John. This is going to get deep. This is going to get, get like psychoanalysis <laughs> kind of thing. I was going, okay, so well, you're a... My, my setup, as far as any live setting, is super simple. I've got my uh, first year, 2001, uh, John Petrucci Music Man, the custom one. And I haven't played a gig since they bought it without it. That's the purple, I think it was purple guitar? Yeah, it's kind of it's got that two-tone purple-green thing going on. Right, mm-hmm. right. Love that guitar. Never, never want for anything more after that one. Um, and as far as an amp goes, uh, you know, again, live, I just go pretty much straight into my Marshall JVM head and it works out super well. You said JVM? Yeah, JV as in Victor. Okay, okay. It makes- yeah, it's a type of, I think about, oh, about oh, 10, 15 years ago, it was their latest model. Is that Worked out real well. No, that one's a. It's full too. It's class oh, A. Okay. Oh. In fact, it was. It was uh, for any gear nerds listening. It was a hundred watt head, <laughs> but a hundred watt tube head is just bonkers level loud. So I, right. I made it a fifty watt head. <laughs> oh, nice. See, I haven't had a tube in a long time. Last one I had was the Silver Jubilee, and that had the little fifty one hundred switch on it, which was always cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Those switches are nice. 
Oh, that's cool. All right. So, and I think, so when I looked at the guitar, I'm like, that's a music man. So, so that means John's probably, he's probably all the things that I'm not in a good way. Like in, in the way that I wish I was like, I was like, he's probably like studied classical is a good engineer. Like just, you know, just really the musical technical. equivalent dude of having his, his own shit music together. Store. Right. The dude has his own <laughs> store. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was always just the, the plays it too fast and loose shoots from the hip kind of blues like you know blues player playing everything I'd always done was always off a of feel let's say and it's just you know it, it more like I, I don't know I guess if we were to make it overly deep or psychological like like a Les Paul kind of player where it's like well those guitars make no sense so it's probably <laughs> probably just you know just feeling it out man like more like that kind of thing and then you look at a music man and you're like that is a wise purchase <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, when, when I bought it, it was very much not a wise purchase. It cost me way too much money. Even back in 2001, it was almost $3,000. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're gorgeous. Huh? Um, but no, there, there's, I've never had an issue. I, I am, you know, I do a lot of theory, a lot of technical stuff. I studied right. classical guitar in college. But yeah. one of the best guitarists I ever played with in a band was a guy who couldn't tell you what a C chord was. And mm-hmm. he is we i it was a joy to play with him we just we worked so well together and he was he could blow me out of the water with his playing you know so right it's 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 all about every individual person has a different approach and, and there's a million and a half different ways that are all perfectly valid you yeah. know I, I found the way that works for me and that's great but there's a, a, a million other very valid ways yeah, it, it, but it almost seems like you could split musicians into t- into those two groups of, of like you know just the the fast oh, yeah. and loose kind of yeah. It, it, and I, I think I, I'm not sure if, if the uh, if both sides are jealous of the other side, but that's probably about fair because you you see something in you know the technical player or like the the super free player, let's say, where it's just like you know, man, I wish I had a little bit of that, but you know, <laughs> instead I don't know how to think technically or whatever the case. So that's pretty fast. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many times where I hear. You know, uh, whatever the, the the new rock song on the radio is, I'm like, man, that's just two chords back and forth. Why can't I just, you know, why do I have to make everything so fancy? Why don't I just do those two chords and write a good melody? You know, so I I, I do know that definitely jealous going one way. Right, right, and I confirm the other for sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and, yeah. Anytime I hear anything classical, or, or even especially like um, like nylon string, like Latin, I'm like, oh man, I so wish I could do that. And classical players have that baked in. It's you know, it's just being able to run minor scales like that and everything. But anyway, all right. So so trolls, what about you? So you're more like on the electronic side. So I think we might be switching more to like plugins, or or are we doing uh, spins, or what are we doing? I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna roll off one thing that, uh, that you know the two camps. Uh, I, I used to play in the uh, you know, like dumb punk bands, cover bands when I was in, in high school and, and nice. university as well. And and it it's it occurs to me if you want to put people into two camps, you've either got the creatives or the gearheads to be perfectly honest it's very rare to find a combination of the two right. uh, a person who knows what who knows their gear but also has an incredible ear for you know composition and arrangement and all that stuff i used to play with we had two guitarists in the same cover band and one of them was like a punk rock guitarist three chords off we go let's bang some heads and he was super good at keeping time and he was really inventive like when I, I, yeah, i'd be behind the drum kit and i'd go hey what about after the second chorus we just drop everything and then we go in on the on the on like the third hit and he'd be like yeah and then first try we'd get it and it was beautiful <sighs> and i'd so usually fun. be the one who messed that up yeah so everything <laughs> we did was like super dynamic and, and really fun dynamic, and then we yeah. had the and then we had the other guy who could run circles around john petrucci like he could just Whoa. he could just run his fingers up and down that fretboard like nothing else but that's all he did like when we were in in, in the rehearsal space that's all he did he just run scales he just right. sit there and, and practice running scales so of course he was brilliant at it it's it sounded amazing and we were like dude maybe we should put that into a solo and he's like no 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 i'd, I'd have to write the solo down it's like write your solo down what the fuck are you talking right. about yeah um, <laughs> He could not, and he could not compose a riff to save his life. He could oh. not. Uh, he could. He could run the scales. He could do all the technical stuff. He had, you know, amps and guitars. Spent all his money on all this gear because he loved the gear and he loved the technical side and he loved the. He was like a mathematician about it. But he right. could not write a fucking riff to save his life. And the other guy just had a practice amp, like a little, like it, it was like a suitcase. Like he just picked it up, rolled it in, plucked it in. It sounded like absolute garbage. It even had a hole in the speaker. It's like really punk rock shit. And it just sounded balls out fucking amazing when he played. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Yeah, no, so that's you, that, that is, is more or less. A, yeah, you, you're laying out the exact the two camps as you put it perfectly. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's always fascinated me, and because and, I've, I've always wanted. I guess it's easy to look at somebody shredding and be like, oh, I wish I could just do that. Like that'd be that'd be a cool thing to have in my toolbox, but it just doesn't go along with the personality. Like you can't being on being in the camp that I'm in. Like you can't even look at the the spelled out tablature and be like, okay, let's learn this now. It's like my, the brain just immediately loses focus. Like I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to do this. This is an exercise. Um, and, it's, uh, and that's and that's why I'm, actually, I'm again I'm really happy that JPS is is in the band because I think JPS you know, correct me if I'm wrong but I think JPS is one of those rare breeds who ha- who is a gearhead who knows his shit he has like I said he has his own music store in Chicago uh, mm-hmm. where he actually sells gear and advises people on what to buy and all that sort of shit but he also I mean I don't usually tell him how to play the stuff that we do in Era Forty Seven I do like scratch guitars with MIDI. MIDI, sorry, whatever. Um, like, this is where I want the guitar to come in. This is roughly what I want it to sound like. Uh, and he just runs with it. I don't. And, and every once in a while, we just go, usually I go, can you turn it up? Um, but that's about it, really. Um, He's like, I need headspace. So, uh, I tend to... Uh, I tend to be the guy who's like, no, nah, it has to be gnarly, or it has to be more evil, it has to, it has to sound bigger and stuff. And, and JPS is like, well, then you can't hear the actual chords. Uh, <laughs> so that's- you're both right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but anyway, that's my, the, the, the gist of it for sure, trolls. It, it's, yeah, I, I, my strong suit is not in writing like rhythm riffs. Yeah, I, I do a lot of lead stuff that I, I think I'm pretty decent at. So. You know, a lot of the scratch MIDI guitar stuff, I, I just kind of try to emulate, emulate that. And sometimes because, you know, the, the MIDI stuff is just on a keyboard, doesn't take into into account some of the practical limitations of how the guitar is actually played. So it's kind of fun to have that, you know, to translate the, the MIDI guitar into actual guitar. Mm, that right. can be kind of a, a fun challenge from time to time. I mean, my my expertise with the guitar is it starts and stops with power chords. That's why the guitar I have <laughs> in my closet is this old banger that my old punk rock guitar uh, player gave me f- 20 years ago, and I only recently changed the strings. It only has two strings on it. It has punk rock. It has an E, an e and an A <laughs> string, and the E string is tuned to D, so that's the extent of my abilities. Um, but but yeah, so, so it is it is um, um, usually. JPS is right when uh, the rhythm guitar thing is usually because you know it's industrial rock. Usually, I mean, if you've listened to a, a Frontline Assembly uh, circa mid nineteen ninety six, you know what kind of industrial metal um, guitar sounds like. It's a lot of mm-hmm. chucking, um, yeah. so so there's not a lot of like leeway into you know, let's get fancy with this. But the lead stuff, the guitar solos, things that's that's what I was getting at. Usually, mm-hmm. I'll write something in that's based most of the time is actually just the lead that's from the original media of whatever we're reconstructing in this case the seventh guest uh there's like a piano solo in there and i'm gonna go this is gonna sound awesome as a guitar solo and send it off to to jps and he comes back with this like oodles and noodles and and he's going up and down the fret slides and everything and i'm like mm, chef's kisses let's run with it okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great no, like, a, like a it's gonna be too wanky <laughs> i love wanky uh, there's something interesting about the industrial guitar sound because it, it's – so my, I guess my influence or, or, or half my background is all Slash-centric. Like the, that's – he's the reason I picked up a guitar. So it's part of me like really loves like, you know, like the root of blues playing and like a great tone and, and tube amps and, and neck pickups and ladies tone or whatever like Clapton would do with the tone all the way down on the rhythm. But, uh, but the other part of me was like in the Tom Morello camp, which was like – uh, having like a disregard for the tradition of the instrument and to where I'm going with this is like an industrial rock always had that or I liked that when it had this blurred line between guitar and digitized sound and mm-hmm. and so like it almost like served the guitar as well to, to sound I don't want to say crappy but like you, you didn't need a tube amp I would uh, is what I'm getting at for for some of like the cool and I, not not for industrial rock because I don't have the you know, I don't have the right to say that. Let's just say, but for for trying to get like a untraditional sound from the guitar, like it's no mm-hmm. longer about like the tone anymore. It's just about like kind of fucking with it or finding like a broken pedal. Oh, oh, it's absolutely. I mean, uh, JPS actually taught me uh, what the industrial guitar sound is. It's a dude who plugs his guitar straight into the mixing board and just turns it all the way up, and that's it. <laughs> awesome. um, but um, no, uh, I actually didn't answer your original question. So let me let me just answer both of them. Um, mm-hmm. So 
uh, my background is not in electronics per se, uh, although technically by necessity it is. When I was a kid, I uh, yeah, used to, uh, in, uh, instead of whatever people in my grade school were listening to, I was listening to synthesizer music. Your Vangelis, Jean-Michel Char, uh, Jan Hammer, that kind of that kind of shit, which always weirded people. I was like, why are you listening to that? Uh, yeah, that's very know. relatable. Um, and I looked at uh, the first record that actually got me interested in playing music was uh, I went through my dad's record collection and I played uh, Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. Wow, and yes, me too. It's, it's, my, it's my absolute favorite record of all time, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and I look at the back of it and it says, Mike Oldfield plays all of this shit. Right. And I was like, how? How the fuck? How many hands does he have? It turns out you can overdub. I know that. <laughs> um. But uh, so, so so when I decided, OK, I'm, I, I want to make my own music, does that mean I have to start learning an instrument? Because I don't think I'd be very good at that. Um, and luckily, this was around the time when trackers, uh, like mod trackers, were becoming a thing. Right. So I got uh, Screen Tracker 2 for my 386 at the time. I didn't have a sound card, so it was all PC speaker. You had four wow. channels of, let's say, digital sound, but it really was, <laughs> you know, if you if you put your mouth to a cardboard tube and just go, <laughs> that's how it sounded. <laughs> um, and so, so I, st I, I, I got started with mod tracker, uh, mod tracker stuff, and and that means I don't have a formal education in anything music related. The only bits of music theory I've been able to pick up is from. You know, just necessity. I I usually say I just roll my hand head on the keyboard and, so, and stuff comes out, but that's is that is actually what happens. I I know when I'm sitting in front of a keyboard or a piano that if I hold down these two keys, it sounds good, but if I hold down these two keys, it sounds awful. So mm -hmm. that's how I know chords. And then from playing, from getting into like actually playing in bands as a teenager and stuff like that, I had to sort of get to grips with, oh, this is what a time signature is. Oh, okay, so that's actually a C major and that's a C minor. Okay, I can't read sheet music. I can't read tablatures at all. Tablatures is like fucking, it's like hieroglyphics to me. Um, <laughs> but but I know from, like, if I really concentrate, I can go, okay, so this is an inverted A minor, I think. I don't know. I'm just holding down three keys and it sounds cool. Um, that kind of stuff. And that's still what happens today. In fact, I was rearranging one of the seventh guest tracks uh, the other day, and it was one of those uh, t uh, tracks from the 11th hour, actually, that has this, this soft arpeggio that runs through it, and it goes uh, over like four octaves, really oh. soft. It's, it's the one that plays when you're trying to solve one of the puzzles. It's called Infernal oh. Melody, which, by the way, there's a whole story about that. JPS Malad will have to tell you about how fucking cursed yes, yeah. that track is. But anyway, so it has this wonderful arpeggio running all the way through it, and I wanted to have uh, a, a guitar playing the chords behind it. But since it was an arpeggio, I couldn't just look at the notes because they were all like uh, bumbled together. So I couldn't figure out what fucking chord this was. So I had to, and this is true, open a tab in my browser, go Google chord identifier and, go, and, and just plot in, okay, these are the notes. This is probably the chord it is. And then I sit down with my MIDI keyboard and go C, A, F sharp, that's a bit weird. Okay, let's go to a G. That's even weirder. Okay, that can't be it. And then, you know, <laughs> trial and error this shit out. Um, yeah. So, so that's uh, so. So, so yes. Um, and the reason I picked up the drums is because you don't have to learn musical theory to play drums. <laughs> you don't. Have, you don't even have to tune your fucking instrument at every practice. You just sit down and you bash it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Drums appeal to me. Um, <laughs> and, and, and time time signatures are fun because even though I mean, and, you know, when, when I was a teenager uh, or in, in my early twenties, and you used to go to parties and get drunk and listen to to, to metal music and stuff like that, you know, I'd we'd, me and my friends we'd, we'd sit around and pretend we're like we were really smart and go, oh, okay, so this this Tool song it starts out in seven eights and then it goes into eight eights and six eights and then it goes into nine eights. Did you, could, could you tell when it switched? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that kind of thing. But we were just like bullshitting. I mean, if you if you tell a drummer, okay, oh, this song is in seven eight, and they go, oh, that's the thing where it's missing a beat at the end. Right, let's go. Uh, so I mean, that's that's the extent of musical theory I need. So yes, technically, I'm in the electronics department, but it's by necessity. It's because I don't know musical theory very well. I really I relate a lot to your coming coming of age musical theory stories where it's like, oh, so okay, so that's an A sharp, and I just remember when I finally started having the chords worked out. 
the first thing I could think of was was how that Simpsons episode with the B sharps was wrong. I'm like, there is no B sharp. <laughs> <laughs> now here's the most fucked up thing in in Danish music theory. It's not called a B. A B in Danish music or European music theory is actually the note that North Americans would refer to as B flat. We call oh. that a B, and the B is an H. And there's apparently the story about a European monk who was who was copying sheet music from uh, uh, somewhere overseas, like back in medieval times, and his handwriting was so bad that his Bs turned into Hs. But if you tell a European musician, uh, play a B or play a B flat or, or whatever, they will go, oh, so he means like a B flat. Mm -hmm. you, you have to you have to tell him it's an H, right? Wow. As soon as they play, you're like, hey, I think you're, I think you need to tune a little bit. You're a little flat there. Yeah. And here's and here's the thing. Here's the thing. I mean, and then you know, I get to high school and I get really arrogant and I'm going to go. Okay, so there's an elective course on music. Yeah, yeah, I want to be a musician. I want to do. I want to do music stuff. And I, it was a complete mistake. It was one of the classes I flunked the hardest. And one of the things was since I've grown up on on mod trackers. Mod trackers were written by um, people from North America. Uh, I actually. Scream Track was written by Finnish people, but they they, they kept the uh, North American uh, music theory. So a B was a B, and a B flat was a B flat, instead of a H and a B. So when I got into music mm -hmm. theory, one of the first like crash courses I had was that a B is not a B, a B is an H, and it's like that already that fuck with my head. And then they start mm -hmm. saying, okay, now draw draw a G clef. I'm like, what the fuck is a clef? Oh, it's the squiggly thing. Oh, yeah. and one of the first assignments I handed in, I swapped around. JPS is going to have a fucking field day with this. I swapped around the bass clef and this G clef. So the, the bass clef was on top and the G clef was down below. And he's like, this isn't sheet music. This is a sobriety test. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> actual, actual words from my music teacher. This is a sobriety test. That's amazing. Oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to have to Very remember good. that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, so the industrial, the industrial. Okay, so now the industrial metal guitar is. Uh, so, so my go-to type of music is. I don't really care what amp it's going through or what they've done to it. I just like my guitars loud, loud and crushing. If I have, mm. if I put on headphones, I want to. I want the guitar to feel like it's squeezing my head. Uh, I want that. Big. Uh, so, um, if I don't know if you're familiar with a band called Detsy, which was a sort of early 2000s uh, vanity project by w one of Cher's sons. Actually, he started this sort of weird uh, synth uh, rock metal thing. Um, the guitar sound in that just sounds like a fucking buzz saw drilling into your ears, <laughs> and I'm like, this is good. I like this. Or um, the guitar sound from let's let's pick an example. Someone actually knows. Um, Quake Three was mm -hmm. written by Sonic Mayhem. Sonic Mayhem have this really aggressive sounding, like you can barely tell that it's a guitar. It just sounds like a building collapsing around you. That's the sort of guitar I like, and that's where JPS usually pushes back and says, "Let's not do that because you can't <laughs> you can't make out any other instrument if we have that sort of guitar in there." <laughs> Well, that, that leads me to. Track. Oh, sorry. That's okay, I, and that leads me to ask uh, before we get into haunted tracks and everything else. So, what is the current project? What what is Soups on, and and what's going on, and and how did you guys get into doing this? Did you you must have thrown out some emails, and and how did this whole project come to be? JPS, you're up. I've been talking my mouth off again. So, um, I blacked out. <laughs> I don't remember what the. Yeah, I don't remember what the initial catalyst was, uh, but I know we had just recently come off doing uh, the, the last album, CDOS Run, which was a collection of yes. uh, just really obscure DOS game music, which I thought was I thought it was a great record. But it's just a lot you know, of fun. It, yeah, it, it, it definitely bombed in the uh, crowdfunding category. So we were a little gun shy and. Uh, Trolls had the idea because we, you know, the the, the soup sign's been a meme on his Discord and everything for years, and and, and all the music it's been just talked about at great length. He was, what if we did a you know a seventh guest thing, and then all of a sudden it started spiraling. It's well, let's, let's see if we can get some extra musicians in here to, you know, to bolster us up, and you know, again, like we always talk about, fill in the spots where we're we're not strong at, you know, things like you know live violin, live vocals, uh, stuff like that, Based. and. And yeah, live bass, excuse me. Yes, live bass. 
Um, C dash run had no life base whatsoever. Yeah. But then trolls, I think at that point we got, I think we did a couple tracks first, but then you emailed George. Is that, is that how that worked? Or did you email him first? Uh, the catalyst, um, as you say, was absolute hubris on my part. We were batting <laughs> around ideas for what to do next. And we were either going to do C does run two, which we were very, like you say, gun shy about, because if no one really wanted the first one, why would we do a second one? Even though we had like a full track list of tunes that we were going to go, this is going to sound great. We were like, mm -hmm. we'll, we'd basically be making it for ourselves. Um, which is also cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, we like to get our shit on vinyl. <laughs> that's really, that's yes. like my main, main motivation for doing all of this. It's just I want vinyls of my own shit. So so, so if, if no one wanted the first CDOS run on vinyl, then they probably don't want the second one either. Um, so anyway, so, so, so out of complete hubris, um, we, I mean, uh, the conversation went, okay, so 10 tracks from different obscure DOS games is not setting the world on fire. Let's find out why. Oh, it's probably because um, just having one track from a game in like a compilation, like a collection of stuff, turns people off in the sense that, oh, it's not tied to any one franchise. Like all the oh. ones that we've been successful with is like, oh, now we're doing a Duke Nukem record. Now we're doing a King's mm -hmm. Quest record. Now we're doing, a, you know, that kind of stuff, a Gabriel Knight record. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have like a compilation of stuff, then, then people are like really interested in maybe one or two tracks, but they're like, eh, you know what? They're really, doesn't really light my shit on fire. So we're like, okay, let's tie ourselves into one franchise or one, you know, game. Let, let's go back to that because that seems to work. And uh, and the, here's where the hubris comes in. Bef I, I don't think we did any tests or anything to begin with. We were just like, what games would be fun? And mm -hmm. I said, seventh guest. And, of uh, and, and and he said, okay, that's one idea, sure. And I went off and I emailed George Sanger, the uh, mm -hmm. composer for Seventh Guest and Eleventh Hour. Um, I had talked to him once before on um, on uh, uh, Roberta and uh, uh, you guys' uh, live stream, mm -hmm. uh, the, the composer's live stream, uh, which I believe Alistair um, yep. he set that uh, organized. Up, yeah. Yeah, uh, which was great fun. Uh, George mm -hmm. wasn't actually part of the actual live stream, but he came in at like the pre-show thing just to say hi to everyone. And I, and I started gushing at him because, you know, Seventh Guest, uh, the fucking soundtrack is awesome. It was the first, you know, the Seventh Guest was the first thing I ever learned to play on the piano because of that stupid fucking puzzle in the <laughs> game where you have to play it Simon Says style. And he was like, that stupid fucking puzzle, I can't even beat it. And I wrote the stupid <laughs> fucking music. Um because it does take so fucking long. Anyway, so so hubris is hi. Uh, you met me once, and I would not stop talking. Uh, would you mind if we did an entire album of your music? And he's like, Yeah, but we could probably work something out. Uh, you know, I sent him a link to like Sense of the Fathers and and the uh, Duke dance party uh, like this is what we've done in the past uh so i think he was expecting us to do like an electronic version of it uh mm -hmm. not knowing that we'd also done c does run which was more industrial rock and that's where our hearts were going uh mm -hmm. so, but he was like yeah okay yeah because he's he's uh, and this is not just because he let us do it i mean i mean he's he's a super kind-hearted person mm -hmm. who's really like uh uh, he he loves it when people he's kind of like Robert Holmes in that regard because he was also like super into what we were doing even though we were completely mangling his original stuff <laughs> like we were just just doing weird shit to it honestly <laughs> uh, but he but he he was like really into it just, yeah 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 because you know musician is a musician like you listen to a different version of a track and you kind of go okay that's interesting what they're doing right. there yeah yeah so George was the same he was like I can you know I can I, that that could be interesting. And also, it might get people to like go back to you know my band camp and, and pick up the official soundtracks, which I have released over there. And, and insert plug here, by the way, the, the fat man and team fat.bandcamp.com. If you want the actual official soundtracks, go there. He's remastered and recorded them, and they're available on his Bandcamp page. It's good shit. Um, but yeah, so he was actually on board. And then I went back to JPS and said, remember those ideas we had batting around? Yeah, hmm. we're doing Seventh Guest. But that's <laughs> apparently, yeah. So and that's well, and 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 the and the running joke became okay. So what are we going to do to seventh guest? We're not going to do like mm -hmm. a and we're not going to do like sense of the fathers Duke Nukem dance party kind of thing to it because we just came up. C does run, and uh, one of the reasons why we did that was a because. I really wanted to hear more of JPS's guitar playing because he's a fucking amazing guitar player and I'm not. And there isn't a lot of guitar on the 
Duke Nukem vinyl or the, he, he played a bit of guitar on the Gabriel Knight vinyl, but that was still really very electronic stuff. Uh, and I really wanted to hear more of his guitar. And I just gotten a, a drum kit, like an electronic drum kit, a nitro a nitro mesh drum kit. Mm-hmm. Um, which there's barely any room for in my room anyway. But um, so so we were like, okay, live drums, live guitars. Let's let's get let's go all in on this shit and let's do the same thing to the seventh guest and the eleventh hour. So the running joke became, okay, so if we're gonna do a rock version of the seventh guest with our musical influences, let's do let's do seventh guest as if performed by Paradise Lost or Typo Negative, because mm. <laughs> you know it's it's gothic, so it's gothic rock, right? Yeah, let's do that. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, it sounds nothing like, but uh, that's that was the running joke, anyway. Yeah, I, I was. We, we definitely, yeah, we went into it with that mindset, but it, yeah, it comes out sounding nothing like that. Which is those bands are great. <laughs> it's like it's like when you see, you know, a random band and they say, you know, our influences are Pink Floyd and Metallica. It's like, no, those are the bands you like. <laughs> you know, yeah, you sound like that. You sound like Leonard Skinner, but you yeah. know. I mean, it sounds it sounds like what we did on C does run. Uh, right. Basically, it's a lot of electronic. It starts with the electronic stuff, and then eventually a guitar comes in, and some live drums come in, and that's you know, and someone someone had his hand on the volume knob for the guitar, and there's a, the other dude's hand is like pushing down on that first. Hand. Just, <laughs> nope, nope, stop it, stop it. <laughs> Give him a little shoot, shoot. <laughs> well, this is what I, I think, love about talking with the. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say real quick. I, I think one of the 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 great things for doing an album like this. With, an, with the full soundtrack rather than pulling out the bits and pieces from other soundtracks, especially with something as, you know, as expertly done as the seventh guest and 11th hour soundtracks is you get to do cool things like carry some of the themes throughout the various songs. You know, there, there's mm. probably just a handful of main themes that are used in all of the various tracks. And it's, it's kind of fun to, you know, get a new track from trolls and, and be able to play the same notes, but in a completely different fashion, you know, and it really ties the whole album together. Mm, much like the Lebowski's rug. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the carpet it's, of the album. It's, Sorry. And, and, it's, and, and uh, the Fat Man does this thing w- with both of those original soundtracks. Is he uses a lot of light motifs. Every get every one of the six guests guests in the seventh guest has their own instrument. Uh, if you listen to it, like uh, 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 Martin Burton has a muted trumpet, uh, Edward Knox has an oboe. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I think uh, Hamilton Temple, the magician dude, that's like a um, uh, like a wind up box, like one of those like monkey dances on a box kind of thing. <laughs> that's that's his <laughs> musical instrument, and they also <laughs> all have their individual theme. Um, and then there's the overarching theme, which is uh, the, the the theme called the game. Uh, which mm-hmm. is the you know, kind of seventh cast do 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 that thing. So every every time you every time something interesting happens, it's always the same theme, but it's played by a different instrument. That's how the that's how the official soundtrack works. So what we did was so what, what what we ended up having was like a bunch of MIDI files with basically the same theme played on different instruments, and we're like. We don't have an oboe. Um, let's okay. So it's up to the arrangement to tell the story now. Now it's up to the you know the way JPS plays the guitar and the way I play the drums and the way because for instance like Martin Burton's theme bedspread, which is a tango uh, with a muted trumpet that basically just plays the seventh guest theme, but now it's a tango, and we're like hmm. fuck, how do we do a tango in industrial rock? Um, I know. Let's add a breakbeat. Let's add um, what, what was what was we threw in a uh, drum and bass. The drum samples, so it starts off sounding like fucking Chasing Status or Pendulum or something, and then it goes into like full on uh, double tempo uh, madness drums, and and poor JPS just has to play the same fucking chucking rhythm guitar over it because it's just too. That, that, there's the thing, only just it's just two fucking chords throughout the, the whole thing, and then you get to do lead guitar stuff, obviously. But so that's that's the fun part. That is taking, you know, trying to tell the story with the light motifs that were uh, done with different instruments instead of ha- each each person having a different like motif uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and try to make them differentiate enough through you know, different arrangements. It makes me think yeah. of uh, Peter and the Wolf a little bit. You know, each one of the characters in Peter and the Wolf is represented by a different instrument and a different little theme, if you've heard of that mm. story. Mm. <laughs> really? Um, oh, for three? Nobody? None of us? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I, 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 I heard that David Bowie did an audiobook of Peter and the Wolf. 
Oh, I kind yeah, of give that. An olive branch <laughs> for you, see? One of there you go. Kind of, I'll yeah. take it. I'll take it. But yeah, anyways, that's that's what it reminded me. But you know what? That is the cool thing. And that's why I was so excited to talk about this with you guys, because you guys take an idea like out of thin air. Like this is this is just an idea. This is something that doesn't exist. And then all of a sudden you, you gather the people around. You make the project happen. You do it. You have a tangible vinyl in your hands in the end. I've got a few of your tangible vinyls right here with me. And it's just that's amazing in, in a world where everybody is so full of like blah, 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 talk, 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 like. <laughs> whatever you do know or you don't know you bring the people around and you, and you guys are just making it happen so thank you no thank you i mean yeah. the it gives me faith that, that's, here <laughs> that's, that's what i mean the reason why we started doing vinyls in the first place is because i went to pax uh, a few years ago and did uh, mm -hmm. and moderated one of the adventure game panels for for roberta um, I was there. which was great <laughs> yes you were it was great fun and then they went by uh, the i am 8 bit booth and saw mm -hmm. they had like vinyl soundtracks for games and me yeah. again i don't pay i don't pay attention to what happens in the world so so i was like mm -hmm. do, do game soundtracks on vinyl is that a thing and didn't and you pick up a grim fandango or something on that trip yes yes i got yeah. a grim fandango and i picked up a mm -hmm. doki doki literature club vinyl if yeah. you can believe it That's beautiful. it's a great game i'm, yeah, I'm gonna defend that game to the hilt it's um, me too i'm in there it wasn't spoiled uh, for me i loved it <laughs> no, we <laughs> well, should have gotten the Undertale final, but I didn't, and now yeah, it's really aw. expensive. But it anyway, is. so I came, yeah. so I came home and and, and and thought, you know, if you have Grim Fandango on vinyl, why don't we have Space Quest on? I, again, right? I gotta say, this is before I knew that game soundtracks on vinyl was like a fucking booming business. I've since mm -hmm. talked to one of the guy, a guy who lives here in Denmark in Copenhagen, who has one of the biggest if not the biggest uh collection of game soundtracks on vinyl in the world and i went by his wow. apartment and did a video with him yeah. and it's just jesus fucking christ okay there's a lot of it i didn't know that at the time so i just came home and went space quest on vinyl hey let's do that no one else is doing it so i guess mm -hmm. i I'm, I'm gonna do it so i just sat down and did it and it wasn't terribly professional uh but uh, but and it was just uh, you know let's just see if this has legs do space quest 4 and uh, luckily, I, I know Ken Allen, you know, the guy who composed the soundtrack for Space mm -hmm. Quest 4. And he was like, and he was, he, he thought it was a great idea. I've always wanted my soundtrack on vinyl. He said, so let's, let's do this. And that's See, I happened. found everybody to be so darn approachable. Whenever I've gotten a hold of anybody from Ken Allen to the Coles to anybody else, they're just like, oh, wow, cool. You like it. I liked doing it. Let's talk. Let's make things happen. Like I have never found like you ever feel like you meet you don't want to meet your heroes because it's just going to be disappointing. And it's like all of these people, the people from the back of the boxes that I have admired since I was a little kid, I'm meeting them in real life. And they're even cooler than I thought they right. would be like and oh, approachable. Shit. Not one of them Actually, has been a letdown. Uh, do, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Charles. Do you have a letdown one? <laughs> no, no, no. Absolutely not. I was going to say Ken <laughs> Allen is Ken Allen is one of the uh, sweetest. I mean, I, 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 like I said, I grew up. Uh, Space Quest was my favorite game. Uh, Fourteen years old. Space Quest Four boots up. I hear that fanfare open up for the first time, and it mm -hmm. says music by Ken Allen and Mark Siebert. And I'm like, fucking hell, those dudes are brilliant. They're geniuses. Mm -hmm. And I, let's just, I just loved his. And I would, I would like sit and listen to the format countdown. I pause the game on just so I can hear that loop over and over and over and over. Yeah again um i just fucking love that and then and then if you told me that 14 year old who sat there and listened to that fucking thing on loop for hours and hours that one day when you're like out of college and you live in a one-room apartment with your wife the person who wrote that piece of music will be sitting on your couch drinking a bottle of scotch and sleeping on your couch i would have shat my pants on the spot yeah um, <laughs> right? but he did oh that's, my yeah. god that's beautiful that's a great like record screech. Out. You're probably wondering how I got here, kind of break. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and I mean, I've, I haven't had a scotch with uh, with uh, George Sanger or anything. I've never actually met him in real life, but he has just been such a great support. He's been mm -hmm. he's been very very supportive every time I've done something to one of the tracks. And it's been a little like, oh, can I get away with this? This is, I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, I told him we were going to fuck with this stuff, but I, this is, this, this might be too much of a fucking. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's consensual just, anymore. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, we're not, we're not really just, we're not really fucking it at this point. We're more like beating it up. Um, so, uh, so, so I'd, I'd send it to him. Uh, for instance, 
there's that uh, music that plays in the finale of the seventh guest spoiler when you get up to the broom at the attic and uh, Ted has this big fight with Stoff and Stoff starts vomiting all over the place for some reason and turns into a snake and all of that and there's this music that runs under it and it's timed to the uh, uh, FMV that's playing um, and we turned that into a fucking 90s EDM dance club song that for some reason ha- gets a no, and after the EDM thing it has a break and then it turns into Mr. Bungle like this <laughs> fucking circus rock music <laughs> and <laughs> And it's and, and 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 still like the tempo is just it's 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 keeping up with whatever's happening on screen. And I felt like okay, this kind of needs a break. It needs to sort of cl- like calm down. For instance, it's first of all, it's, it's way too short. Uh, so it needs to have it needs to be like an overarching thing. It needs to have a little break so we can speed things back up and go full on, uh, you know, for the ending. So I I and this is very hard to say. I actually went in and wrote some stuff myself. I inserted myself into that tune like i wrote a little a little bridge i try to emulate you know the style that the fact but i'm like i'm not a musician so me sitting down and actually writing new stuff to inject into whatever he's done that was like okay i am overstepping my boundaries here this is terrible <laughs> so i sent him i sent him the track and i went yeah you're not you're probably not gonna like this uh but uh here it is and uh if you're okay with this we're gonna run with it and he was like dude what the fuck are you talking about this is great i'm like so he's been very very supportive i have to say and john liked the the guitar on that one because apparently it's all phrygian scales and i have no idea what that means but he loved it (laughs) yeah he's uh george singer for any theory nerds out there he's a big fan of uh at least on this soundtrack there's a whole lot of phrygian stuff which is which just lends itself so beautifully to industrial rock because a lot of the industrial songs that you can picture in your head are Phrygian. So you just don't see it very often. So it worked out real nice. And yeah, and George Sanger, he's been just such an amazingly kind and generous person with all of this, where he just seems to be having a good old time with us, you know, just absolutely changing. Yeah, it's sometimes very fundamental levels his his music and he's been nothing but great doing that he did that mm-hmm. video for us just to help promote it on the, on the kickstarter and it's just mm-hmm. yeah it's just a treat to have him be so supportive john yeah. you might have to correct me here but is phrygian like the the gypsy gypsy sounding sale like um like kind of spanishy vibe to it yeah kind of so the, yeah the, the long story short is you know put it if you want to put it in guitar terms if you're starting the scale, the very next note is the next fret. So it's, it's, there's, I think there's, there's another mode that's like that too, but the, the Phrygian one, it, it gives, you know, like an E, then the next note is minor, an F. Kind and of vibe. Just that. What's it, what's that? Kind of like a minor vibe, like a, like a, um, uh, not like a darkness, like a, like a little bit of a, a sadness or a drama, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's they call it a flat two. It's got a flat two in it, and it's definitely one of the modes that leans minor for sure. Yeah, right. and right. I mean, Seventh Guest is full of like really sad stuff because they're yeah. ghosts, they're dead, and they've been hootwinked, and they're none of them are really nice people except for Eleanor and Hamilton. And Hamilton keeps looking over his shoulder at doors that aren't there. So, <laughs> um, so so yeah, I mean, the Seventh Guest has a lot of. It, the, the funny thing about the seventh guest soundtracks and especially 11th hour is how far they go in terms of um, uh, not just underscoring what's happening in the game but also just taking chances usually mm-hmm. you would have okay it's a horror game so we're gonna do horror music you gonna we're gonna you're gonna have uh, the, you know the, the psycho thing where you have a C and a B next to each other and just hit that periodically and, and just do creepy shit but no um, he George Sanger decided, you know what, uh, this person needs a tango and this person needs uh, this, this sort of circus music going on. And 11th Hour is even wilder. Like 11th Hour is this uh, m- mid-90s, uh, gritty, uh, quote-unquote modern, you know, you're walking through the decrepit house, everything's a bit more, there's a, a few more tits and a few more, everything's got to be a little more like a... Like a uh, edgy in a way mm-hmm. like uh, so, so uh for better or worse mostly worse but um so 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 his his uh his take on that 
is to go, okay, it's gritty, it's dark, it's got titty, it's got all the things, it's, it's trying to be edgy and stuff. You know what this needs? Hawaiian guitar. Maybe some jazz. Let's do jazz. It's, and it's like, what? Really? So we, we're ending up having to, you know, for the 11th hour, but there's, there's going to be a whole medley of jazzy stuff. Wow. That and then I have no idea how that's going to sound when it comes out uh, as industrial jazz. I've never even heard of that, but we'll see. <laughs> so, what is this cursed track that you guys have brought up? What's going oh. on? With it? Are we even going to get it then? And if we listen to it, will we survive? What's happening? <laughs> oh, it, oh it, it is going in. The amount of hours we spent on that fucking thing. It's called Infernal Melody, and it mm-hmm. fucking lives up to its name. Holy shit. <laughs> Um, first of all, okay, from, from, from my perspective, um, just doing the arrangement, we're not even done with it. Now, here's the thing. This, this, this has a killer punchline. Um, uh, but okay. So I load the thing in, I load in the MIDI file from the game because that's where it all starts. You know, I take the original MIDI file and then I rearrange that. And then I start thinking, okay, so what can I do to fuck with this thing? Um, so I load everything, everything in. And the first thing I have to do is figure out what BPM it is. What tempo are, are we talking about? Um, turns out that that whole arpeggio thing I was mentioning earlier, that big luscious arpeggio is played on a harp. Uh, and it goes mm-hmm. all the way over the scales and all that is not played to a click at all. He sat down and played that on a fucking keyboard Oof. without a click. Oh. So first of all, I have to grit all this shit. I have to take all these massive arpeggios and grid them into some sort of workable BPM. Takes forever. Okay, mm-hmm. next up, um, there's a middle bit. After it's done with all this sweet arpeggio in 3-4 time, uh, you know, waltz, tempo, 3-4 time. Be- beautiful, very nice, very luscious. Again, uh, it has a break. It switches to 4-4 four, four and a completely different tempo, <laughs> and <laughs> which is a, a mercifully actually played to a click. But that means you have to you, know, you have to tell your daughter, okay, now we have to get into a different tempo and a different uh, time signature. Fine, we get that working. <laughs> finally, <laughs> I finally get the whole thing sort of arranged. I start because what usually the workflow usually is I'll 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 arrange the tune pretty much as it is in the game, and then I'll do a few things to it, and then I'll send it to JPS, and then we'll sort of talk back and forth like what what would be cool to do with this thing? What would be interesting? <laughs> Sometimes I just run with if like I have like a quote unquote great idea in my head I just run with it and I send him something completely bad shit and he goes fine but uh, with this one I I arranged the whole thing because it was cursed already to begin with and uh, I uh, on on the evening I was going to send him all this uh, stuff right before I went into export uh, the stuff and send it to JPS the whole project goes silent as in completely silent. You press space to actually play something, nothing comes out of the speakers. I can see the little meters moving, but nothing is coming out. And I'm like, that's weird. Um, okay, let's just, oh, oh, it's probably an audio device thing. Let's go in and reset the audio device. Let's pick a different audio device. Let's, let's turn the volume up. Did I turn the volume down? Is there something wrong? Are my speakers unplugged? All this stuff, nothing, nothing. I load up a different project, everything plays fine. So, okay, so this project is cursed. <laughs> but I can still export the stems, you know, the individual stems. So uh, JPS can import those and put them in, in, in his stuff and, and have it come out sounding good. Uh, so he does. Uh, I have a completely silent project, but he has stems that he can actually work with. And he puts it all together, sends it to me. JPS works really fast, so I have it in the morning where, you know, t- why is so he works when I sleep and vice versa. I get it in the morning. I listen to it on my morning cigarette break. And it's just, what the fuck is this mess? The violin comes in at the wrong place. Everything is off kilter. Uh, something keeps huh. going. It's not supposed to. What's that echo? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> and, 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 we, and we message each other and go, yeah, it's cursed. It's cursed. Yeah, it's cursed. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, later that evening, I have my my kid in uh, in you know, in the bedroom. He's watching a video on one of the monitors I have, and I'm over on the other monitor, going, "What is wrong with this fucking project file?" <laughs> um, I go through it. I finally manage to work out what it is. It's one of the send buses that have been soloed. Uh, in the in the DAW I use, the the solo and mute buttons are all in the same place, except when you do buses. For some reason, they've moved the buttons over. So I thought I'd went, I'd gone through all the tracks and muted and unmuted and soloed and unsoloed everything, everything except for the fucking buses. So okay, so one of the one of the buses was soloed. Fine, so it's not totally cursed. I go in and I listen back to it, and all of the different tempo changes, time signature changes that I put yeah. in, they're they're still there. 
they've just decided to take a break. They're not going <laughs> to fucking do anything. So, again, all the stems, uh, are, uh, the intro sounds fine, but after the first minute and a half, everything gets off tempo and everything is not gridded anymore. And everything just sounds like a fucking mess. <sighs> so I sit down and try to work out why it is. And then it's just like, nope, fuck it. I'm just, I'm just going to put in new, temp- just new, new flags, new tempo changes, new time signatures. Luckily, I know what they are and where they're supposed to start and all that. So everything slots back into grid. And yeah, finally, we've got a working project file. It actually plays. It actually is gridded now. Everything's fine. Control S, mix the stems, send them to JPS. He gets, you know, he mixes it, returns it the next morning. I listen to it on my cigarette smoking break and I go, this is boring. This is dull. <laughs> Nothing's happening. We, we spent all this time on this fucking tune and it's dull. We need to do something. And that's where we're, we're at currently with infernal melody <laughs> so finally it works but it's dull so we need to do something to it oh god that's rough yeah because you've i imagine you've already well i was gonna see probably already heard it a million times trying to fix it but it sounds like a lot of the problem was a silent problem when you're when the you're silent problem was, the time problem was, and, and the and the tempo flags not working i still don't know what the fuck was up with that um but it, yeah that first mix and and jps is such a nice guy like when he hands something back I think he wrote something like, um, uh, so here's a jumping off point. Like, here's a start. <laughs> like, <laughs> instead of just coming right out and saying, this sounds cursed again. <laughs> but it, 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 sounded, it sounded terrible. It gives me enough to start getting the, 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 the template for everything going. Yeah, but I was like really. And it's worried. funny that we were, were were talking about it right now because I was planning on working on that today, and you're like, "Oh wait, we've got this podcast to do." It's like, well, clear the schedule. Uh, no. Oh, oops. sorry. <laughs> the <curse> continues. <laughs> no, <it's okay. laughs> There's always tomorrow. But I'm, I'm I was like really worried. Some, sometimes when I send you stuff that doesn't really work or has like uh, like a drum track that I forgot to quantize or something, I'm like super worried. When you send stuff back, you never tell me. So I'm like super worried that you think. This is the level he's at, isn't it? Like he actually thinks this sounds good. <laughs> like he actually thinks there's no problem with this. And and this one was like borked. It was like fucked backwards into existence. Uh, it was super awful. And I imagine you, you listen to that and go, "Okay, he's lost it." But I'm going to keep a straight face. <laughs> no, with Infernal Melody, it was most definitely it was. It's hard to explain, but it was obvious that there was issues with with the with the session going on. I, when you do this enough, you start to to recognize what's the session being goofy and what's you know possibly a <laughs> ill thought out idea. Are you? I'm just was, just a nerdy question. Are you guys using the same doll? Does no, that complicate no. things? No. Okay, now Control I need to know which one's what. Mixcraft. I'm using Mixcraft, uh, not from choice. Uh, ironically, a, a, a company a few years back uh, called uh, Giggle Horse Games uh, oh, yeah. said, we'd like, you, we'd like you to compose the music for our adventure game Absolute Zero that we've been working on. It's coming out like, every, like in a few months, and it hasn't mm-hmm. come out yet. Um, but it looks really, really good. And I, and I said, I'd love to, but I don't actually have a DAW. Uh, at the time, I've, uh, this was before King's Chill. This was before uh, the Space Quest reorchestration vinyl. This is many, many years ago. So at the time, I was working on a hushed vo- voice, uh, a pirated version of Ableton 6 or 7, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just, you know, for shits and giggles, I didn't actually, you know, put out anything with that. I was just playing around. Uh, and Ableton's like really expensive. So I said, I, I, I told Giggle Horse, you know what, I, I've I've been using Ableton a bit. And, and the uh, industrial band I was in, I was a teenager, the, the dude who did all the programming, he used Ableton as well. So that's where I picked it up and learned it. Um, uh, so, and they go, that's really expensive. Uh, we're going to get you Mixcraft. And it's like, I've never used Mixcraft. She's like, ah, nah, it's probably fine. <laughs> a doll is a doll, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, so I kind of had to like relearn how to walk and talk with the Mixcraft. Yeah. I think I've gotten the hang of it now. JPS uses, I mean, not not that Mixcraft isn't professional regular stuff, but it's very rarely mentioned in the same breath as Logic or Pro Tools or Ableton Live. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, JPS is all over the professional shit. Yeah, I've been using uh, Cakewalk and Sonar for mm. over twenty years at this point, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I love it. It's, it's to, to, again, to anyone out there listening, if, if you want, a, and it's right now it's free, but they're going to start charging for it again soon. 
but yeah, oh. no, I, I love that software. It, 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 it does create kind of unique problems because, you know, Cakewalk is, is very similar, you know, your Cubase and Logic and all that stuff. But Mixcraft is really its own thing. And a lot of the terminology <laughs> and the settings and how it's done mm. don't really carry over. So, you know, if Trolls is having an issue, I have difficulty trying to, to you know, visualize it and try to help out, try to figure out what's going on because things are very different between the two pieces of the software. I think that's, and that's why we do solely when we're transferring back for this, just the audio files because audio is universal. You just send the audio track, you can load it into anything. Yep. That's it. That, that's, that's why I always mix it down to stems uh, right. and send that. I never, never send a project file. I don't even know what plugins uh, JPS has. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't know what plugins I have and it doesn't really matter in the end because uh, uh, everything we do is, uh, is, is, is just audio. It's, basically like being in a rehearsal space and someone plucks in their shit and someone else plucks in their shit and then they jam away until something comes out we don't know each other's gear <laughs> very well um but yeah mixcraft is i mean i i've i've, I've come to love it but it has some quirks <laughs> for one thing whenever you load in a, a vst that has an arp as in something that's supposed to line up with the bpm Sure, it'll play fine when you're actually working in the project file, but if you um, bounce that into stems or into a WAV file, you have like a 50-50 chance that that VST will suddenly shit the bed and decide, oh, I'm yeah. now in a different tempo. Oh, have fun oh, with this. It's a and, gas and, lady. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. And, and there was a, a time when we did the Space Quest 1 movie soundtrack, and, and yeah. I was just, I had to learn this the hard way because I just, you know, send stems. I mix down to stems. Everything sounds fine in the project file. Let's mix it down to stems. Send it off to people who are going to mix this and make it sound good. And that would be JPS, Brandon Bloom, and uh, JBH uh, over the Discord. They were mixing this stuff. All three of them just went, uh, is this supposed to sound like that? And I had to go in and, and play, play the project file and everything sounded fine. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And they'd send me like a test bounce and I go, what the fuck is that? Okay. So I've learned now that whenever you do something in Mixcraft that involves VSTs, your best bet is to uh, do like an, like an in-project bounce, like freeze the track. So it makes a WAV file of it. And then you can kind of tell if that's going. So, oh, uh, here's an interesting one. Um, so when I do like uh, MIDI guitar on the seventh guest tracks, and uh, when we did uh, C Dust Run, I do like little MIDI guitars for JPS to play along and listen to. Um, every once in a while, and we still haven't figured out why, uh, when you bounce down the MIDI guitar, it's a it's an app called or it's a it's a VST called Ample Hellraiser. And it's, mm -hmm. it sounds really good, actually. Yeah, it's it's really good for a for a for a synth uh, metal guitar. Uh, obviously, not as good as an actual human playing it, which is why we only use it for scratch guitars. Um, but uh, but that's that's the VST I use because it sounds like a guitar. So that's what I'll that's what I use. Every once in a while, though, you bounce something down, and it creates a huge ass explosion, a nuclear <laughs> bomb going off at the start of the track. And JPS has sent me back test mixes of stuff like Coffin Dance from Seventh Guest. You know, the, the boogie thing that goes on when you're solving mm -hmm. the coffin puzzle. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the, the, for the longest time, the test MP3 I, I, I had to listen to in my car started off with this nuclear blast going off at the start. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, are you sure this VST is fine? No, no, it's not fine. I'll, I'll freeze all the tracks in the future. Sorry. So it's it's a good yeah. job when it's not sending people like explosions or like a weird prog rock tempo in place of what you meant. I mean, I, I mean JPS JPS must have gotten it, again. Is is he serious? Is this is this nuclear blast supposed to be there? No, it isn't. <laughs> well, there was, well, I think it, yeah, I think it was Coffin Dance that started off with that one, and I'm like, okay, yeah. well, let's just go in for that kind of noisy industrial thing at the beginning. You know, it didn't seem <laughs> too terribly out of place. No, but it was loud. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty loud. The same thing happened in that Infernal Melody song, though. Again, that was another one yes. of the cursed parts of it. God, that's right. Yes, because one of the things... Scared did, the daylights out of me. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even mention that because, of course, one of the things I did when it went silent on me was, again, mute on mute, solo on solo, all the individual tracks. And in that process, I forgot that when you freeze a track, what Mixcraft does is it takes the MIDI data, the MIDI track, makes a separate audio track where it puts the WAV file of that frozen track, and then it mm. mutes the original MIDI track. 
I had unmuted all of the MIDI tracks so they would play concurrently with the already bounced. So so first of all, the violin and the guitar were monstrously loud. And of course, the fucking Hellraiser VST does the nuclear explosion again. So this quiet, lilting uh, harp sound, you know, three, four waltz time, very soothing, starts out with a fucking nuclear blast right at the start. <laughs> <laughs> no, takes... not not even at the start. No, not even at the start. Like midway through. Oh, Is even right? worse. <laughs> one, one of those classic trolls nuclear bombs. You know, it's his, it's his signature yeah. thing. <laughs> it was definitely yeah. It was like three minutes in. It was and it was completely out of nowhere. <laughs> Just enough for you to have your guard down so it could properly scare the shit out of you. Nice. Yeah. Yep. I mean, one one day we're gonna have to sample that and actually use it for real. Like use it for something. <laughs> Well, I'm sure I've got it in in some of these sessions. I, obviously, I mute them, but I'm sure they're still there somewhere. Oh, I'm sure I can recreate it. I'm sure all I have to do is not pay attention, and it just sneaks up. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I've got I've got a, I get a question. I really do want to ask. So I know it's been kind of a while, but but real quick or not real quick, it's up to you. Um, <laughs> I'm curious what it's like. This is such a like a vaguely. I don't know, vaguely put question too, because I, I don't know what I want from it. I just kind of want to hear you talk about it. What, what do you do? <laughs> That's really bad. All right, hold on. Um, <laughs> I just put some effort into it. Okay, so you're, you're taking a lot of songs that potentially don't have percussion or don't don't really have a drum track, let's say. Um, is, is that like, I guess I want to just know, is that like the most fun to, to produce like a rhythm track for it? And I just want to know more about what it's like to put percussion and rhythm tracks to, you know, like scores or, or things from games that don't have you know, any sort of percussion. Oh, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to let JPS, uh, answer it, but I just want to get in real quick. Uh, it's all fucking ego on my part. I have a drum kit. I'm going to fucking use it. So, <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to shove that. I'm going to shove drums into as much shit as I can. So that's my mm -hmm. motivation for doing it. I don't know what JPS is. This. So with me for a lot of that kind of stuff, it's, it's a combination of things. So you take, you know, take the original context, obviously, we're, we're, we're paying homage to, you know, the greatness that was this soundtrack and the game and all that stuff and what it meant. And we're, we're, we're keeping the same general vibes for it, but we're, we're, we're kind of dis dissociating with the very specific use of it. So we're, the way I approach it is not necessarily, you know, e exactly what it was used for in the original game. Just if I were to have, you know, a song with these chords and this kind of general feel to it, how would I play this, this lead part or how would I, you know, mix the drums in and stuff like that. And just kind of, you know, whenever you're doing cover stuff like that, the, one of the most important parts is to make it your own. We're not trying to do note for note covers. We're trying to throw our own spin on it and keep, keep true to the original and pay respect of course, to the, to the great original and you know, try to add something of our own into it as well. It's that that hubris that thing trolls always talks about. Yeah, <laughs> that is that is the professional answer, and and it's, you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things we really wanted to do because we had such fun doing it on the Gabriel Knight record was to, in a sense, make it like a concept album because it's just the music, but we wanted to tell the story of the game in mm -hmm. musical form. So instead of uh, instead of uh, doing it like a note, it's not a remaster. It's not a, a recreation of the original soundtrack. It's a way of telling the story using the original music from the games, and 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 repurposing it or mm. reorchestrating it or whatever to tell that story. So um, we we throw in for the seventh cast. We throw in uh, audio samples from the actual game with permission from Trilobite, by the way. Yay! Hmm. Um, so that we can, so we, so so the so the the album starts with he was a drifter moving from t no actually it doesn't even do that it starts with Stauff going old man Stauff built a house and you know does that whole thing and then it mm -hmm. bombs into the game you know the, the 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 theme song from from the actual and then it goes into he was a drifter and then starts telling the story of Stauff and then it starts telling the story of this of all the seven guests and eventually uh, we we drip feed in stuff from Tad and then the whole thing ends with um, you know the confrontation in the room at the top and it's got samples of Tad and Stolf battling it out and, and you know the seventh guest part ends with Tad going you fixed it I'm free again or whatever the fuck he says and 
then the closing credit skeletons in my closet, which has Jackie, you know, from CGG singing on it, um, mm -hmm. comes in as, as sort of like the closing credits thing. And 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 one of the cool things that, that we did, I can't remember if it was my idea or JPS's, but uh, the seventh guest outro, the one that ends with Tad going, "You freed me. Everything's changed now and forever." Oh, that's the tune. That's the name of the tune. Now and forever, and it, mm. and it goes into this lovely major chord, like everything's resolved. A angels mm. are singing, all of that stuff, and then. We do this thing where there's um, uh, we we've actually taken the uh, the main theme from the eleventh hour, which is the game played on Hawaiian guitar, and we've EQ'd it so it sounds like it's coming out of a TV, and then we play the news oh. report from the eleventh hour intro where it says uh, you know, police have stopped looking for Robin Morales. It's, it's clear that something awful has happened to her, and it goes click, and there's the sound of grinding gears, and then the clock strikes 11 and Stoff laughs manically and that's how the seventh guest bid ends awesome oh, then, yeah that was that, so satisfying <laughs> that, that would, that mm -hmm. would lead into the 11th hour uh, bid and obviously the 11th hour is not going to end on, on such a poetic note it's going to end no. because it has to <laughs> it has to yeah. end with the main menu theme Mr. Death it has to mm -hmm. because there's a yep. line in that very very silly song that says I can't sing the rest and we have to just stop the record right there. That has to be the last note on the record. <laughs> the last beautiful. note has to be a record scratch. Yeah, so we even have to switch around the lyrics to make that fit, but that, I, I'm just dead set on it. Even one of our uh, guest um, contributors to the record, Frederick, uh, actually, backseat designer Frederick, yeah, nice. uh, he, did some, he, he did some synth work on, uh, on one of the 11th Hour tracks. He suggested that if we can do it, Let's make that record scratch. You know the one uh, that sounds when you, when you pick something in the main menu in eleventh hour. I can't sing the rest. Record scratch. Let's put that in a looped runout groove on the last side of the final, so it just goes on forever. We're actually, I like that. stuff like that a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, Frederick Olson's been been contributing some synths to to trolls to, to add in. That's that's some of his contributions to the project. And uh, I didn't know which were his and which weren't, so Troll sent me a, a project. I even forget which which song it was, but right. I was doing the mixing, and I halfway through it, I got to this one track that just did, made my eyes water. And I sent a message to Troll. So I'm like, "What is that? Just unholy <laughs> abomination?" That that and you go, "Oh, you know, that's just Frederick." Like, oh, okay. Well, that doesn't explain it, but it explains it at the same time, you know? Yeah, yeah that tracks. <laughs> yeah. It was one of the lead instruments, and I don't know. I mean, Fred sent me uh, some of this, you know, the, the synth stuff that he did, and I put that into the project file that I was doing. And he he sent along a version of the lead. It's uh, the track is Rain, which is sort of like mm -hmm. the main theme of the Eleventh Hour. It plays during all the significant bits. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really weird track too. I love it. And he sent me in the lead bit, uh, but played on this. Like imagine, like it was it's almost like a like a Trent Reznor ish thing. Like he'd taken some sort of synthesizer, like a real modular synthesizer, and he'd like played the thing on it, the lead on it. But then he'd run it through like a like a Tube guitar tuber. pedal or <laughs> yeah something, yeah. or he yeah. just he just recorded onto a cassette tape and then ate the cassette tape and vomited it back up or something. I don't know what he did to it, but it just sounded like nightmarish play this through that, that boss like, heavy metal pedal that everyone likes to shit on <laughs> I, am, I was gonna bring that up earlier to the boss metal zone into the board is the metal zone, sound yes. nice mm -hmm. yeah yes. <laughs> and it sounded awesome and it i mean so so it's it, it's in the track obviously we lowered the volume a bit and maybe gave mm -hmm. it some reverb and stuff but it's it's in there uh because it you can't throw out something that evil it just has to stay in <laughs> right <laughs> oh yeah absolutely especially in this kind of a project i mean the whole tone of it is that little bit of darkness that little bit of you know that edge like you say kind of i mean phantasmagoria too because i played it recently went in the direction of going just a little bit darker than anything before just a little bit more nudity a little bit more you know that sort of thing the second so, one yeah yeah hmm. yeah but, i mean especially um, oh sorry am i interrupting no no Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I, just, I just saw the meter going up and down. It's like, oh shit, am I interrupting someone? No. Um, uh, 
yeah, you're right. It's it's sort of a darker. Uh, I mean, it's it's supposed to be gothic rock, but also, you know, I mean, Seventh Guest is kind of a Scooby Doo uh, gothic horror thing. I mean, that's at least what Graham Devon, uh, one of the designers, described it as. It's it's horror, but it's Scooby Doo horror. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's not gonna. You can take off its mask at the end, and it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that sort of stuff. I mean, there is vomit, but it is not. Hmm. Uh, but the the eleventh hour went a bit in a more sort of let's be gritty, edge lordy kind of type of people, and it's actually what drove trilobite uh, to pieces unfortunately because uh, they didn't you know the two designers didn't see eye to eye on that idea uh yeah. but uh basically i mean it it's it's not i mean it's just slightly goofy horror ish uh but we are trying to treat it with very deep respect i mean in mm-hmm. instead of people remembering I, uh, I i would imagine and there are a lot i mean if you see youtube reviews of the seventh guest and the eleventh hour everyone talks about how goofy the fmvs are and how slow the gameplay is and how the puzzles have nothing to do with the story and how the story is really hard to follow as well um and and and, and all of this stuff and yeah you could totally make that argument that it's it's goofy at least with modern eyes especially with modern eyes i should say uh but but we there is a really really good story in there uh, that deserves to be uh, told and deserves to be treated seriously. At least I feel. Mm-hmm, right. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, even even the official novelization. We were talking about this before we started uh, the show. Even the official novelization is pretty damn goofy, and it was written by the dude who wrote the original script. So somewhere between the game and writing the novelization, he just decided, okay, yeah, it's a cartoon. Now fuck it. <laughs> um, the guy actually got high as shit uh, right around midway, and <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Uh, but we we're, we're trying to we're trying to like like tell it like you know the Netflix adaptation. Of the seventh guest like we we want to treat this as seriously as possible and on a personal note it's also been kind of a dark time for me personally making this project so obviously some stuff has gone into darker territory audio wise than uh we would normally i mean uh, since of the fathers was this like fun and games kind of let's let's fucking do this let's pump it up and uh and try and tell the story soberly and, and seriously of course but also let's let's bring in some break beats let's sample the almond break let's do fun shit with this this one got a little heady at times uh for me personally at least well, as an audience though i mean that's feeling emotion or feeling something like that in the music i mean because it mm-hmm. obviously it's going to come through people want that i mean something that's raw something that is a little bit off or maybe some dissonance just in in your own life i mean you can look at that with a lot of famous musicians when things are going really difficult for them oftentimes the music they produce has something extra in it it's like you lose we win yeah yeah I mean, so, sucks uh, to be George Sanger, who has to listen to <laughs> has, he, <laughs> has, has to listen to a depressed Danish person knocking out versions of his tunes. But yeah, that's well, uh, it's working. You guys are more than getting. halfway there. I'm, I'm looking yeah, at I, your numbers, I and about, I know it. Go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, it's, I, I talk about that all the time, though. It's kind of like the artist dilemma, because you know, especially in, in this realm, you know, great art comes from suffering and all of that stuff. Right. So it's like when you have art that isn't inspired by, you know, hurt, then it's not going to come out sounding deep and meaningful. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very, it's, it's that double edged sword. Okay. So I wrote this, this, this great music, we did this great music and now I'm rich and I'm famous and I'm happy. And well, how do I write that same song again? Well, you can't, you know, it's just, it's like, why does Metallica not sound like, the same Metallica from 1985. Well, because right. they're not drug addicts and they're rich, you know, like exactly. <laughs> it's like not going to be the same. How, how can with- Jonathan Davis go out and, and oh, well, obviously he has his his own issues. I'm not trying to belittle <laughs> them or anything, but I mean, course. how can he go out and sing stuff from the first Corn record? in his million dollar adidas tracksuit uh, now he does it and he does it spectacularly but you think okay mm-hmm. right yeah. well they get better on the technical side but they lose that angsty you know early energy so it's like it sometimes it balances out and not always yeah mm-hmm. yeah i would assume with something like that it's more of a more of a performance than anything which nothing wrong with that i'm not i'm not knocking right. anything like that but i i would bet it's quite a bit of performance yeah. involved there oh yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, that's and- it and I mean, serendipitously, I feel uh, not to not to bring this back to me all the time. Although that is one of my traits, um, it's something I'm very good at. Uh, serendipitously, we picked a game uh, to to tackle or a project to tackle that actually, if you look at it a certain way, 
if you don't look at it as a 90s FMV with some, frankly, slightly hammy acting and, and puzzles disconnected from the plot and all that, there is a very deep and serious story there. If you mm-hmm. if you want to look deep enough and you can translate that into some fairly dark uh, uh, music, you can tell that story in a, again, like I say, it's the Netflix adaptation of The Seventh mm-hmm. Guest. Like you can, you, can, you can tell that story in a different way that is disconnected from the... Uh, again, I'm not saying that's the legacy of the Seventh Guest because its Seventh Guest is a magnificent game that deserves praise and respect, but it does have a reputation these days, at least amongst, you know, YouTubers, dumb, dumb YouTubers like myself, uh, for being slightly goofy. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the record we're doing is not goofy, and mm-hmm. partly because we want to pay respect to the work that was done, and partly also because of where my personal headspace has been the past few months. As so, yeah. That's where it is. Part of me wants to give some some of that credit, which I have no right to do because it's this is for you to say, trolls. <laughs> well, both of you, honestly. But part of me almost wonders how much you growing up with uh, Vangelis and Mike Oldenfield has to do with your like propensity to tell a story with the music, because I I, I, I grew up heavily influenced by by Vangelis and and kind of influenced my professional life or what hopefully is my former professional life. Hopefully this game does good enough. But but it's mm-hmm. it's that desire to, to to tell to tell a story with the music because I always felt like long story short that the music in let's say Blade Runner was one of the characters in the film. Like it, it was it absolutely was that vital to to and and if we've you know uh, yeah we've totally gotten away from that in modern film and we don't really cherish or, or like I don't know value I guess the the scores as as what they used to be. But anyway, I just I'm almost I guess I'm gonna just go ahead and mutate this into a question. Is do you think that could be the case that that listening to Tubular Bells and Vangelis like ha- has your mind frame of looking at how to make the music a character? Uh, for for me personally, I, I think uh, I I don't know if it, it was a catalyst or anything. I've always been interested in in storytelling uh, and and knowing my limitations uh, as a. I've, I mean, I'm not a writer. I'm not a game designer. I'm not any of these things. I'm not even a musician technically. But now I have a band with an actual musician in it, so we can use that as a storytelling <laughs> framework. Um, and and I mean, some of my favorite bands. Uh, or some of my favorite albums like The Wall and uh, Marilyn Manson's Antichrist Superstar yeah. and, and stuff like that are all uh, are all records that tell a story, sometimes a little convoluted, sometimes a little hard to follow. Uh, those are fun. I mean, one of my favorite albums is Genesis is the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, which is completely impenetrable, but it is a story nonetheless. And right. it's really interesting. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I love love storytelling outside of your because when you say storytelling you either think of four dudes around a campfire or reading a book um i love i love the idea of alternate methods of storytelling music is a storytelling medium most people don't seem to either agree or or care about that part of it they say you got a you got a spotify playlist uh let's let's um uh let's watch me whip and watch me nay nay fine (laughs) if that's what you're into (laughs) i'm not knocking that at all but it's also good for uh uh, telling some sort of cohesive story and that's what we tried to do with the gabriel knight record where we had these long medleys of different tracks that told the story of a character like Malia's uh, theme started out with the uh, Voodoo Mound music and then morphed into, I think it was the Swamp music, like when you're going to the Hound 4. And, and then there's the tune that plays right when you're inside her um, uh, mansion and, and all this stuff. So we made these medleys that told stories of individual characters. Uh, Eyes of the Snake was uh, was the story of Crash, the informant, who <laughs> ends up being choked to death in a church from millions of miles away. And <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> well, so your Kickstarter is doing really well. Now I'm looking at it in Canadian dollars because I'm over here in Canada, but you're well over halfway. I think here you, uh, by the time this episode comes out early in the week, it'll be even further. You guys have some really fantastic rewards, including even uh, versions of the record that have colors in them instead of the traditional color and, and some other cool stuff. So why don't you let us know what some of those rewards are? JBS, again, I've been talking too much as i always do no <laughs> you're you're a better talker i say i know you always say that english is your second language but you speak better english than i do when i was born in milwaukee oh. so <laughs> which, uh, which yeah, we so all the, know is the home of the english language <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly place. exactly um but no so there are some some great little um 
rewards for the for the Kickstarter stuff. You know, like you said, the, the colored uh, trolls will know better the specifics of the colors. There's a, a few uh, color variants, but the one that gets me is George uh, Singer was so very kind and went and dug into his own personal collection of stuff from this time period, and he found. Uh, an old fat man, which is, you know, his nickname, George Fat Man Singer, um, an old fat man uh, coloring book mm-hmm. that he's very graciously donated as part of the reward scheme. And, and so there, there, that in and of itself is uh, worth the price of yeah. admission, I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that one it's is, beautiful is looking. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and, and it's, it was made in 1994, so a year after The Seventh Guest came out. And it's the original. It's not like something we photocopied or anything. He actually dug it out and is going to sign it. And also, it is an authentic artifact that he's sending out. So we're very, very grateful about that. Also, I kind of feel bad about putting you on the spot all the time, JPS. I'm very sorry about that. It's just I don't want to be Billy Corgan. So <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you're not. That's all right. The only thing you'll be so you'll be smashing is your Kickstarter goals out of the Hopefully. park. Yes, that's wow. the plan. Thank you. God, I hope so. And thank you so much. Yeah, and and oh, the other rewards is we're gonna do like a like a cassette tape uh, version that I'm gonna hand up on my dad's old uh, uh, Technics uh, professional grade level, uh, but I'm gonna like buy cassette tape, blank cassette tapes, and do a hand up version of it. I mean, it's gonna sound as cassette tapes that you can actually buy today which is not as great if anyone's ever watched the tech moan video you'll know cassette tapes mm-hmm. didn't always sound like crap but now they do because all you have is the cheap sh- shit uh mm-hmm. so it's it's not going to sound terribly great but it is going to be a collector's item and we are going to do as a band we're going to get me and jps and uh, jackie and michael our bass player and eric our violin player we're going to get all in a in a little discord huddle and record individual greetings to the person who backed for this tape so all the tapes are going to start with a personal greeting to that wow. person yeah that's the rest of stuff that's really cool. and uh and there's the box set thing where uh one of the things i kind of had to i i wanted to get that in there uh for no other reason than because i thought it would be super super fun um you know how in seventh guest all the guests get a secret letter from stuff mm-hmm. like it goes uh, my dear edward welcome to my house no actually that's mm-hmm. brian Dear Mr. Mm-hmm. Dutton, welcome to my house. Uh, the house is full of clues, all this sort of stuff. So I wanted to include like a letter to the backer from Stoff. Uh, mm-hmm. It's basically just going to be, you know, the letters from the seventh guest, but reworded, uh, you know, so welcome to my house. The house is full of clues. Uh, since uh, I remain as always your host, Henry Stoff. Um, and uh, the reason why I wanted to do that is A, because hey, it would be pretty cool. And B, because my wife, um, writes in cursive like mm-hmm. this really elaborate cursive and she's never been able mm-hmm. to write in anything else she doesn't do block letters like she really yeah. has to concentrate to do it so she writes in this really sometimes slightly hard to read illegible <laughs> cursive <laughs> uh, but it, it really looks like 1920s 1930s period cursive so i'm gonna twist her arm and have her write the <laughs> letters to the packers oh, nice. so it looks Absolutely. so it looks like it's you know right. period authentic Oh, that's lovely. Oh, I like that touch there. So, uh, yeah, before we wrap up the episode, I want to hear from both of you. Any shout outs you want to give to any, I mean, including this project, obviously, go to Kickstarter, back it, soups on, hit it right into Google. It's going to take you there. Click the buttons. Ooh. It's just, it's going to be fantastic. But outside of that, is there anything that uh, we'll start with you, John, that you want to bring up or shout out to? Oh, I just. Well, first off, we got to thank, you know, George Sanger for, for being just so, so into what we're doing, you know, just a silly little project that, you know, we take very seriously, but we understand that we're, we're, we're just some people coming and trying to make a vinyl for our own, let's, let's face it, for our own greedy ends, because we both want more vinyls with our music on it, like Trolls was saying <laughs> earlier. Absolutely. Um, but he's been so gracious and so, so helpful. And, you know, that, that video he's got that we put on the... Uh, on the Kickstarter page is just hilarious. Um, I just want to thank everyone that's on the the SQH discord. Just, you, you know, you, everyone here is, is part of that discord, I believe, but you just cannot imagine how friendly and knowledgeable and funny everyone is there. I could spend all day. I have to tell myself, do actual work today. Don't spend all day (laughs) talking with everyone on SQH discord because I have work. I got to get this mix done, you know? 
Um, everyone there is just so amazingly helpful. And, and like I mentioned earlier, not just with, you know, video game stuff. They just, you could talk about 1970s cars and someone will know exactly your answer, you know, and yeah. just, yeah, just nothing but great people over there. Well, it's a really cool demographic, adventure gamers. I mean, if you think about it this way, uh, although there are some similarities, there is no real common denominator to any of us outside of we all played adventure games. What a random common denominator. So you've got this pool of like <laughs> the coolest people that are just so different. And yet we have this like locked in thing that's the same with all of us. It's, mm. it's such a cool dynamic. And that's one of the beautiful things about this community. I've, you know, I've been part of bunches of different communities in my time, and most of them just fantastic, but nothing like this where it's just so accepting and just everyone is so very different. And that's one of the things that makes it so cool is that everyone yeah. has these different perspectives from different parts of the world, different, different experiences in life and just the whole nine yards. And I never tire of hearing it, you know? I mean, one of the coolest things, uh, I mean, not to, I'm not going to blow my own trumpet because I did nothing but start a Discord, actually started as a Slack server, and then someone suggested, let's move it to Discord. And I was like, okay, there's 10 of us, why not? Who cares? And and I, I turned my back on it for five minutes and 800 people have joined. I had nothing to do with any of that. I just opened a Discord server. Um, but one of my, one of the funniest facts, uh, or, or one of my favorite facts about that community, and, J and JPS is absolutely right, it's a community of absolutely brilliant people that I um, am so lucky and thrilled to have in my life. And, and I don't know what they're doing with me, but it's it's great that they do it anyway. One of my favorite things is we have one of the lead devs, if not the inventor of DOSBox, and one of the lead devs of Scum VM in the same place, swapping ah. dirty memes on our Not Safe for Work channel. That is just fucking brilliant. <laughs> I know. I love it there. I'm too intimidated to jump in and I keep thinking about what I want to say or how I want to contribute because obviously that's one of the ones I have notifications on for. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. No, there, are, there is there is no uh, bar of entry and there is no, no you have to be this interesting to, to, to be in. I'm sure a lot of those 800 people are lurkers. Uh, yeah. But it, it does feel like like joining like like going to a clubhouse and it like does. with with like Stranger Things type shit and just sit there and read comics and talk weird shit. Like, right. Hey, I, hey, I looked at a poster of a nineteen seventy car. My dick got hard. What's that about? Um, <laughs> I can tell you what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I got some ideas. We're not in the vortex right now. <laughs> oh shit! Oh, we've got to keep it in the vortex. Sorry. God, in the vortex. Right. Oh, shout out to Pixie, our vortex moderator, who is yes, absolutely a princess. Uh, damn it! Don't uh, obey your queen. She knows what she's talking about. Um, oh, J JPS already stole my shoutouts. Uh, yes, Chris Discord. Yes, George Sanger. Absolutely. Um, to all the uh, composers uh, who I've interacted with in the past who have turned out as as Paul said, um, never meet your heroes except for the ones that are really cool, and they've all been really cool. Um, Roberta Vaughn obviously gets a lot of credit because oh, she yeah. keeps hi hyping yeah. me up and and picking me up when shit goes down. In fact, she even got me to PAX last year when you know all the uh, you know me getting booted off a moderating panel for absurdly stupid reasons and she went yeah. you know what let's just let's just get him on a plane anyway come and hang mm -hmm. out and she, right. she's been absolutely fucking amazing you guys uh anna paul you guys are fucking awesome and the whole cgg crowd are absolutely awesome as well Jeez. and um uh, um shit uh to uh, to uh, darcy james iha and jimmy chamberlain for putting up with billy Corden. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. And I think you have a couple of shout outs too, don't you, Paul, to a couple of the people in the Adventure Game Network and uh Yeah, right. Drop those down. <laughs> right. Um so well and also go go check out forty seven error forty seven dot band. Nailed it. Damn it. Mm -hmm. Um I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> there will be no edit there. So just error forty seven dot band and you guys could check out uh the C D DOS run. Wait, C DOS run, mm -hmm. sorry, I read that yeah. C D. It's got but some it, quest for glory music on pun. it, so get in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah one try for quest. It's such a dumb pun. And I think JPS even had to ask me, what the fuck does that mean? And I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, you know those children's books? See Paul, see Paul run. Paul's got a ball. Hooray. C does run. I'm just so glad to hear there was thought behind it I, I, that it's not just there like by happenstance because now now it's ten times more fun. C does run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's brilliant. All right. Yeah, go go there. Check out our friends in the, the Adventure Game Hotspot Network. Um, One Short Eye has a video dropping right, well, like right now, but for when you guys are hearing this, like a week ago. But still, go check it out because it's a speedrun video on 
Monkey Island. Look, it doesn't matter. It's one short eye. He's got some of the best YouTube content out there. So check him out An Adventure Game. Oh, fuck, I forgot. I forgot to plug the AGH network. I'm going to get booted. Oh, oh you better do it right now. Oh, well, that's, wait, that's what we're doing. We'll all plug it together. One, two, three. AGH. Do the thing. AGH. Buy my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, pretend, just pretend Paul's reading off my list. Yeah, yeah exactly. He is. If you're listening, Weird Gaming Adventure. No, you're, I think you only have to do it on your channel, right? This is yeah, oh, we yeah, do it you're good. Ours. Yeah, you just happen to. Yeah. And I'm not doing anything right now, so I'm cool. Cool. Yeah, totally. you're perfect. No, you're good. Um, so yeah, check out all of our friends there. I think that's really all I wanted to do. And you know what? Since since you're here, trolls, let me let me just embarrass you a little bit and say a shout out to you and thank you very much because mm-hmm. you're Space Quest historian. There you go. There's the shout out. So this isn't as cringy. Mm-hmm. So go check out Space Space Quest historian on YouTube. I'm sure every one of our listeners literally already has, but but actually click yeah. subscribe if you have it maybe because you know sometimes everyone gets a little lazy with that click the damn button Mm -hmm. sorry for yelling at you but also to to trolls (laughs) just personally on a personal level thank you for being you because i love your channel so much it's like Mm -hmm. my favorite tv show and i i I don't know if i've ever said it to you to you before but like i wouldn't be making the game that i'm making right now if it wasn't for you literally like your ags videos were the moment where i was like i'm gonna do this i'm finally gonna do this and your videos taught me how to start doing it and you've just been priceless to me in my life in many different areas and so, thank you. You're awesome. Fucking hell. Oh, cheers, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm very bad with, with how to... I, I don't know. I don't either. It's fine. No, no you're it's doing ter- good. none of us are good yeah. at that. We all, yeah. we all think we all suck, but things. we all know we all oh, rock oh, at the same time. I know. And, you know. I know. I, 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 uh, thank you for, for keeping my stuff safe. Uh, all the stuff uh, yeah, I bought on eBay and I couldn't get shipped Aww. to Denmark. I just send it to Paul and he'd like, sit on it. Uh, so and and then drop ship it to me. So thank you so much for for committing mail fraud on my behalf. Great. Now I don't know. I don't know how to receive that myself. Neither of us. We can't. No. I don't. I'm incapable. Anna, do something. I mean, and that would, concludes would today's me, episode. Me a, <laughs> made of Atlantis box. <laughs> On the side, it's like, it, yeah, it's yeah. It was, it was like, okay, I got all this shit that you sent to my house. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it, but I'm going to send it to you. Uh, is there anything else you need? And I said, I don't know. Do you have a fate of Atlantis? And he goes, Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> and so you chuck to do. the fate of Atlantis box in there. So cheers, man. You're a prince. Thanks. Yeah, he absolutely Thank you. is. And shout out to JPS because you make my shit sound good. Yay. So good. <laughs> It's great. Okay, and now that concludes today's episode of the Classic Gamers Guild podcast. And hey, we hope you enjoyed our chat with Trolls and John of Era 47 and everything that goes with it. And if you want to stay connected with us outside of all the other links we've already thrown you, uh, you can stay updated on future episodes. Follow us on Twitter at CGG Podcast or at Phantom Fellows. Like us on Facebook, Classic Gamers Guild. We're also a page, Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. Join us on Instagram at CGG Podcast. Send us an email mail at classicgamersguild.com and don't forget to check out our patreon we will read your names next time i swear to you uh thank you so much for supporting us all of you are amazing we might even pay some attention to you no no i'm not just saying that for the 50th time i swear to you so thanks for listening and we'll see you guys next time for another exciting adventure in gaming and also wishlist my adventure game to go to phantom, the, the phantomfellows.com. Okay, all right, I'm done. That's the one. Yeah, don't do a murder. That was that was fun. No, that was that was so much that was so much fun.